Matt and Greg used to interview movie stars, but now they're doing a podcast. Hello, folks. Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm Greg Srizavosti. Me too. And that is Matt Levitz. We are Matt and Greg used to interview movie stars, but more importantly, we cover the best of film. We do. We do. The best movies that you've ever seen. Oscar winning. Yeah. Prestige. Box office. Iconic. Yes. But then we also cover movies like Waterworld. Which are even more than iconic. The best of the best. Is it does memory not serve me correct? Lee. Um, well. <laughs> it's not considered. Look, Waterworld is not considered one of... Kevin Costner's most shining moments, but maybe through this episode, Matt, we will get the listeners to get on board with, at least me, that this is one of the best all-time, the best films ever made. You know, it's not one of his shining moments, but it is one of his shiny moments because he spends most of the film wet. <laughs> that is one of the many topics that will be discussed, the wetness of it all in Waterworld. Matt, who are some of the people who are, we're going to be interviewing? Well, well not just some. All of the people we're going to be hearing what? from are Tina Majorino. Gene Triplehorn, Dennis Hopper, and Kevin Costner. And this junket took place on July 16th, 1995. We also have the spirit of Kevin Reynolds. He's still with us, but there's Kevin Reynolds talk in the movie as well, which we'll allude to talk about. He's sort of, yeah, a little bit, but he's also kind of avoided. And we'll discuss why. We'll, we'll discuss d- that why. But, you know, before we get into the wateriness, that's not a word of Waterworld. I, Matt, you, you really had this really, I'm excited as usual to actually talk a little bit about our lives per Junket Talk. Junket Talk. We haven't done that in a little while, a so time. it'll be good to get back to that. And our topic today is out-of-town trips, which we have alluded to in previous episodes, but we've never really gone into the nitty-gritty of how they worked. We did travel quite a bit to do these junkets. Yeah. We didn't do all of them in Los Angeles. We would fly, well, New York, probably what? We went to New York about once a month. Yes, once a month, like... Like, Matt, once a month, but I would think actually 1.4 times per month, meaning there would be times when we would actually go to New York twice a month. Or 0.4 times a month. (laughs) A lot, essentially a lot of times, a lot of our times during the 90s, at least from the early to mid ones, or maybe the whole 90s, was actually going to New York. We did it so many times. We accumulated so many frequent flyer miles. We spent so many hours in the air. We would usually do the red eyes, so we would try to sleep, but I don't know about you. I had a hard time sleeping on red eyes. The reason, folks, we would do... Okay, one of the things regarding press junkets, being a press junketeer, a junketeer, and the reason why red eye flights from LA to New York was so important was because when we flew out of LA, say around 10 o'clock at night, and by the way, another good move would be to actually catch, let's say, Waterworld in the, you know, in the screening room here in LA. If we get the movie out of the way... It doesn't matter what movie the junket was, we would want to see Waterworld. What? Or whatever movie that we were junketing for that weekend in New York, we would try to get that film out of the way before we hit that 10 o'clock flight. They would hold early screenings in the previous weeks. They would give us the opportunity. We could travel and go to the other city if it was New York or Orlando or Toronto or Hawaii. You know, we would go to all these different places. Atlanta, yeah. They would give us the option to see the movie the night before the interviews. We could always do that if we wanted to, but nobody ever wanted to because if you saw the movie in L.A. a week or two before that or a few days before that, whenever it was, then that would free up your night in the out-of-town place. So you wouldn't have to go to the screening and you'd be free. And the whole for, day. For me, well, not the whole day. I, I guess the first day because right, we right. would fly in about 6 a.m., mm-hmm. And we wouldn't have anything that first day because we had already seen the movie. So especially in New York, because I'm a big fan of Broadway musicals, I went to plays all the time. And because I was there once a month, I would see, you know, each trip I would go to maybe two plays, sometimes three. I would stand in line at the half price ticket booth because I didn't have anything to do during the afternoon. Usually our interviews were in the morning and we would finish up about noon or one o'clock and then I would just hightail it over to stand in that ticket line in Times Square and get my tickets for that night and go to shows because I didn't have to see the movies. I'd already seen them in L.A. That is so cool, Matt, because what I would do is yep. the opposite. I would order pizza from the local Ray's Pizza. Oh, get, Ray's get, Pizza was good. Well, it was good. I'm sure oh, hopefully it's still good or it's still existing. But then I'd, then I'd get a cream soda, a couple of cream sodas, go to my room, 
and stay there until the junket starts. <laughs> I was a hermit. Really? Yeah, hermetic. So I was going hermit. to Broadway shows. And I was you staying were, in the hotel room, enjoying the. You were the, watching pay per view. No, not not even pay per view. Just hanging out, just relaxing, just relaxing. I I don't remember anything memorable I did in New York other than stay in the hotel rooms and just chill while you saw all the Broadway things. Matt, you were alluding to the miles and miles of frequent flyer miles we would accrue. There was a purpose in our traveling in a, in a weird way. Well, we could use those in different ways. I mean, some of the junketeers would upgrade their seats, so mm-hmm. they would sit in first class. For me personally, I was a newlywed, and we didn't have our kids yet. We got married at 24. Jonathan wasn't born until we were 29, so we had five years of being married without kids. Mm. And she had a job that didn't pay her that much, and she had kind of freedom, so she would go with me a lot on the trips. Nice. Not all of them, but I would bring her as much as possible, and we would get to hang out in New York and go to plays, and it was awesome. I'm just remembering as you speak right now, there was one flight. I, I'm sure we shared many flights, but I remember there was one flight you and I shared, and we had some pretty good conversations. So Did we? We did. Okay. I do remember we were all on TWA. Yes. There was a group of us, and it was so weird because... You know, I mean, you would drive to the airport by yourself and you kind of had this mentality of, you know, I'm going out of town, I'm on a business trip. But then you'd walk into the terminal and all your friends would be there. And it would be all the same guys that you're hearing on these interviews. And it would be like camp. Like, you know, hey, Greg, hey, Bob. And it would be fun. Sometimes we would sit together on the plane. Not always, because like I said, some of the guys were sitting in first class because they upgraded. But we would hang out together in the terminal and then we'd kind of split up and sit in our different seats. And then we would all arrive together. And a lot of times we would share a car to the hotel. Right. And we would hang out and there and hanging out was kind of a theme in these out of town trips too, because I remember something else I would always do. We would get per diems. It was generally what about 125 per day, 125 to 150. Yeah. It, it would vary. And that wouldn't include the price of the hotel because that was already paid for. So that was just for restaurant food. And of course, New York hotels, you're going to go through 125 pretty easily because everything in hotel restaurants are really expensive. We still had good enough meals for that price. But yeah, we would go pretty, pretty fast on the per diem stuff. We got to. Yeah, especially the people who drank. I mean, alcohol was (laughs) really expensive. That's why that's why I remember now. Because of the per diem, I stayed in my room eating hotel food and just watching television. But you said you got raised pizza. So you, you actually had to pay for that out of pocket. I used to be... Uh, yeah, I did pay a couple of things. Good, good, good observation. I ate Ray's and the hotel food. Hence, I gained weight. <laughs> okay. Good, good weight. Good food weight. Good, good culinary food you, weight. You could also save some of your per diem by going to the studio's hospitality suite because there was always food there and right. you wouldn't get charged for that. So before junkets, we would always get breakfast there. They'd always have eggs or French toast, you know, in these big silver pans. And, we, and by, by doing that, we would save about 35 to $40 off our daily per diem. Exactly. Yeah. That, and there's a couple of other tricks. There's a, a trick that I never used, but I was taught this trick that some, some junketeers would actually not even eat in the room. They would order the finest wines, maybe a couple of bottles. Oh, yeah. And just put it in their luggage. <laughs> so that great bottle of wine I don't know it's the first time for you hearing this yeah no. they, they just get their wine and put it in their luggage or another thing this has nothing to do with per diems but everything to do with privilege or maybe just a little uh, cutting corners some junketeers would actually when they'd go into the room they'd check in the room they'd see a, a fresh robe they'd put the robe into the luggage right call room service and say I don't have a robe here <laughs> So these were some of the little tactics that junketeers would use to, to not, I don't uh, want to exploit I, I never, all of these I never opportunities. Stole, I never stole anything from hotels. Neither did I. Neither did I. I'm not a towel and robe grabbing kind of guy. Yeah. I just don't see the point. I mean, I'm not poor. I can buy myself a robe if yeah, I want it. Same it's, pair. what, 10 bucks? Come yeah, on. Yeah, but uh, these, were, yeah, these were nice robes, man. Hey, uh, yeah. No, I, ne- I never did that either. But these were some of the activities that we... And not, you know what? I, I would always bring my own shampoo and soap. Really? I don't even use the stuff that's provided. And, you know, it's free, but it's not the stuff that I'm used to. I Just for me personally, if I use soap that's not the brand that I'm used to, my body feels weird. 
Yeah, I, I, I um, I, under your notes, you were going to talk about the bachelor party scavenger hunt, which we'll never mention ever, folks. <laughs> if you're going to comment on this, this will never. It has to do with Abba Dancing Queen, yeah, uh, undergarments. This is never going to reach the. Don't ever mention that. But here's the thing. Well. We can talk about it without giving away all of the details. This was one night when we didn't go to a screening and a bunch of people just decided they wanted to go to a dance club, which was not something that I normally would do, but the group was doing it. So we said, all right. And I remember there was a lot of drinking going on and we wound up finding a bachelorette party and they were doing a scavenger hunt. And I think they needed somebody's underwear. So one of our gang like went into the bathroom and took off his underwear and came out and gave it to him it was it was it was pretty funny i, I don't know who that person was um greg Srizavosti. but here's the thing that was, that wait was that you no that wasn't me that I wasn't did, me. i didn't think it was that, you. that wasn't me but here's the thing i remember that 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 was a pretty fun pretty interesting night um i didn't have too many interesting nights other than me in the hotel room all the time but there was another moment which i actually did not there were a couple of times when there would be snowstorms in New York. Yes. I went to a particular junket where I had to actually stay in New York because I was snowed in for about a week and a half. Yeah, I did. I wasn't at that one. I think my brother Joel was. Right. I believe you guys have talked about that. Yes, and you were at the Rumble in the Bronx one. I was at Rumble in the Bronx. I remember there was a huge snowstorm. And of course, we're from L.A. We're not used to snow at all. So none of us were dressed for it because we didn't own snowshoes or really heavy jackets. And what I remember about Rumble in the Bronx was for some reason we missed the ride. They had a shuttle, you know, for all of the junketeers, you were supposed to be out front at a certain time and get on the shuttle and they drive you to the movie theater. And for some reason you and I and a couple of other people missed the shuttle. I think we were doing something else and we came out front and went, oops, they're gone. But then we went, well, it's only, what, 10 blocks away? We can handle this. We'll just walk. Not realizing that it's a huge snowstorm with the snow coming up to our waist, practically. (laughs) I think we got about three or four blocks before we realized what a horrible mistake we had made. (laughs) Just a couple of rubes from California trying to navigate the snow. And I I believe we wound up having to hail a cab because we just could not walk that distance in that amount of snow. Overall, the, the time in, for the media, whether you're print online, actually, whether you're print or radio in the 90s, before the advent and TV, before the advent of online, when online became a, a much bigger thing, we, those were the salad days when members of the media would go to New York so, so often. These days, it's just not the same, even if you're online, maybe only the top out, online outlets. Radio... The radio outlets today, man. I mean, I, I do junkets once in a while, but I'm yeah. considered now an online outlet because of Hollywood Outbreak. But right. the radio, other than a few people left from these tables, they're just usually mixed in with the print people or the, and mainly the right. online but, people. But only the TV people fly now. Only the TV people fly now. So this, as we were talking about our, our days in New York, these are as that, uh, that uh, Woody Allen co-directed movie, New York Stories. These, this is just a story from the past. So I do miss these times. Um, the... the the limos yeah, back we, and forth. We, uh, yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of good times. It was Ron Brewington who would always get a limo. Everyone else was happy with cabs or whatever. Some people would get town cars. Ron was addicted to this limo company, which was really loud and gaudy. Like there was bright neon. I remember like you would open the door and it would just be pink and blue colors. And I don't remember I, that. I never went into one of those limos. I, they were all just jet black for me. Really? Interesting. No, that's really cool. Okay. Yeah. No, that was his thing. And, you know, we would we would share the ride because it would save us some money. I mean, we would get reimbursed for that, but that would always take a few weeks. So it was just kind of easier to split the fare. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember riding in Ron's limos quite a bit. I did, too. I, I guess I'd, I maybe, maybe you're right about the, the, uh, the colorful stuff, but I just remember a jet black limo. We, we, rem- we remember these times with fondness, folks. Now, um, Sure. Now, I, I wanted to circle back. We were talking about the per diems a bit earlier. What I didn't get a chance to say was a lot of times at dinner time, I would go down to the hotel restaurant, you know, ready to have dinner and spend my per diem. And I would always look around to see who was there. And every single time there would be friends, you know, sitting at a table, usually together. And we would know that this was going to happen, that more people were going to show up. So the first ones there, which sometimes was me, 
you know, we would ask for a big table, you know, it's just me right now, but I think more are coming. So I'd get a big table and then sure enough, people would kind of filter in it's dinner time. People have per diems and we'd all wind up sitting together and we would just tell stories and laugh and have a good time. And it was just part of the, the bonding, you know, we just, we would never know who was going to show up because sometimes people would do other things, but we always knew someone would. And generally, you know, we might be sitting there for sometimes two or three hours. I would leave early if I had theater tickets, but sometimes, you know, these guys would just sit there at these tables for three or four hours, just hanging out and having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Those were, those were the, those were the days. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's sometimes it'd be up to like 15, 20 people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It was great. Uh, Another thing I wanted to mention was being tired at the tables because of the time difference. And I think we may have even mentioned this in another episode, but New York is three hours ahead of LA. So if we have to wake up at 6 a.m., our bodies are telling us it's 3 a.m. So every time we did a New York interview, we were always super, super tired because we had to wake up so early. And that would affect us at the tables. We weren't on our game when we were super tired. Plus, you had to turn the air conditioning off, so the rooms were hot. We were operating on very little sleep, and those were tough. Yeah, those. Were the, the, I remember one part, one particular junket, just based on the time. Uh, during a Robert Altman interview, I found myself almost nodding off at the end of the table. And yeah. He, no, sometimes me. you really had to work not to fall asleep. Yeah. Not because the interviews were boring. They far from it, but just because of the time difference and the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now uh, we're off to Waterworld. Sure. That's an out-of-town junket. Let's go to Waterworld. That was not an out-of-town. That was an in-town junket. No, I meant Waterworld. Oh, Waterworld itself. Different. Yeah. Out-town. Oh, yes. That's, that's not in our world. That's not it's a, out of town. It's out of town. It's, it's in the water. Our, who do, so we're getting Tina Majorino. Yes. Now, before we get into her, actually, I wanted, I've got some general things I wanted to say about the movie, just to kind of give some background. You may have noticed that I didn't list the director as one of the interviews of this junket. This is a production that was plagued with problems. And here are some of the highlights from the film's Wikipedia page. I just kind of wrote down some notes here. During production of Waterworld, the film suffered a series of cost overruns and production setbacks. Filming on water is really difficult and expensive because everything moves around randomly. Sets, boats, lights, the barge that the camera is on, everything is always drifting, which makes it impossible to get the shots right, and it keeps pushing your schedule back. Then, as if that wasn't frustrating enough, suddenly there was a hurricane that destroyed their multi-million dollar set, and they had to rebuild it. Universal Pictures initially authorized a budget of $100 million for this movie, but production costs eventually ran to an estimated $175 million, which was a record sum for a film production at that time. Nowadays, that's chump change for a big summer tent pole, but remember, this was 1995. Joss Whedon, who is the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel and writer and director of a few Avengers movies, he flew onto the set to do some last-minute script rewrites, and he later described it as Seven Weeks of Hell. Because, as he described it, the work boiled down to just writing down Kevin Costner's ideas and not being allowed to add any of his own. Kevin Reynolds did receive full credit as director, but he eventually left the project in the middle of filming because Costner drove him crazy, constantly overruling him on decisions in nearly every scene. So he left, and Costner took over as director for the rest of the shoot and in the editing room. And that's why we didn't talk to Kevin Reynolds at the junket. It wasn't really his movie anymore, and obviously he wouldn't have had anything nice to say about it or about its star. So clearly Costner took this whole thing over, but you have to remember that Hollywood views everything through a prism of success or failure. This movie got terrible reviews, and a lot of people did really hate it, and it didn't do well in its theatrical run, so history remembers this as Kevin Costner's ego running amok, and the film is considered to be one of Hollywood's great disasters. And that really did hurt Costner's career, and maybe deservedly so, but compare this to Titanic, which came out two years later, and it shares similar nightmare production stories. But when Titanic came out, everyone loved it. It was a huge hit, and it won Best Picture at the Oscars. So director James Cameron was hailed as a visionary who stuck to his guns. It's all perspective, right? 
in a little while, you're going to hear Kevin Costner's take on that whole thing. And he definitely presents himself like he's coming from an honest place. He doesn't make excuses. But you also have to keep in mind with all of these interviews, you know, if you were going to talk to these people now, 20 plus years later, they would probably give you the full scoop and go into all the difficulties and the tensions and the fights and all of that. But at the junket, they were all there to sell the film. So to a large degree, they're all smiles and no, it was so great. Everyone was so friendly. What a dream job. But there are some things that they don't shy away from, especially with Costner. And you can still hear them putting the best face on it. I mean, that's what makes them actors. So you can kind of take these interviews a little bit with a grain of salt. There's some honesty and there's some spin. It's kind of a combination of both. Yeah. Yeah. uh, The first interview coming up is Tina Majorino. Majorino. By then, at this point in uh, 95 with Waterworld, she had already established herself as a top child actress. Yeah. She started in When a Man Loves a Woman, the, the film with uh, Andy Garcia and Meg Ryan in 94. Same year, she had a pretty big role in uh, in Karina Karina with Whoopi, rem- Goldberg. with Whoopi Goldberg and Ray Liotta. I remember actually doing that press junket. And then she was also in that film Andre. All of the stuff. With the seal. With the seal. All of these movies came out in 94, which doves tail right into the following year in 95 with Waterworld. So at this moment in time, we are interviewing... Tina Majorino at the top of her game, just as a child. But there's a lot of things to come um, afterwards, as we will allude to in our postscript. So I did want to say, interviewing kids was always tough. It could be like pulling teeth. Oftentimes you get short answers or even one word answers. And so it wouldn't take too long until the room was completely out of questions. (laughs) We just look around at each other going, help. So... Anytime we knew that one of these was coming up, we'd kind of brace ourselves and we would ask the publicist how long we had with that person. And in the case of Tina Majorino, it was 25 minutes and we'd be like, oh, God. But listening to this one now, you can really hear the troops rallying. You know, we're working together as a team and I think we survived it mostly unscathed. But you can really hear us scraping the bottom of the barrel. So tell us about your last birthday party. (laughs) What movies have you seen recently? Because, you know, those were the sound bites we all needed for our shows. This is a room full of desperate junketeers. But Tina was cool. She was a good sport. You know, it's, it's a fun listen. If you've been following the saga of the dreaded Beatles question, there's a very funny moment in this interview. I won't spoil it, but I'll just say if you don't know what the Beatles question is, you can go back and hear the explanation of it in the Junket Talk segment in our seventh episode for GoldenEye. And lastly, I like to do these little tributes from time to time. I know we're going kind of long, but I, I want to do this. The, the very first question that you're going to hear being asked is by a woman named Bonnie Churchill. Bonnie passed away in July 2017 at the age of 89. When we knew her, she was a sweet grandmotherly type at the tables, and the talent always responded to her, kind of like they were talking to their own grandmother. You know, they would be charmed and they would soften. And she would especially connect well with younger talent like Tina Majorino. Bonnie brought a great vibe to these rooms. I always liked her. I, you, you liked her too, oh, right? Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, she was nice to everybody. And I've got a fun little fact. I didn't know this, but I found it in her obituary. I don't know whether you know this, Greg. In 1938, at the age of 11, Bonnie played a bratty kid in a Bob Hope movie called Give Me a Sailor. How cool is that? I have no idea. Yeah. And then she started working as an entertainment journalist in the 1930s and 40s while she was still a kid. She would go to movie premieres and ask celebrities for interviews right there on the red carpet. She'd be like 11 years old. And they would always stop because she was just a kid and she was cute. So she would talk to them and then go home and type up their answers. And then she would sell the sound bites to newspapers. And she wound up turning that into a lifelong career because that's basically what the Junketeers did. So that's how long she was doing this. You know, good for her. A little addition to that, she just always asked really good questions, and her questions would actually make some really good answers. Uh, She made the interview table a a better one. So, Yeah. Take it away, Bonnie. Could you describe some of those scenes that you did that you said there was one where he was holding you, you went down this huge rope through fires and everything else, or wire. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you had to do that were kind of exciting and scary? Mm-hmm. Um, I had to do one scene where I, um, I swung on the rope with Kevin from one pontoon to the other. That was really fun because it's like tar- being Tarzan. And um, 
Also, I did, I hung off the eight hole gate. That was really scary because I was really I was so much lower um, from Gene, and it's like my it just felt real. Although I was secure hanging from a harness, that that was really scary. Um, I had to be pulled out of the water by Kevin when he's bungeeing down and grabs me up. That was really scary. I, <laughs> I screamed because you know all of a sudden you feel you feel these fingertips on your on your shoulders. You're all uh oh, and then all of a sudden you're up in the air. If it just feels like you're flying, all of a sudden you're up in the air. It's weird. Um, um, I had to. Be by, I had to be by lots of explosions, but they were far enough away where they couldn't hurt me or touch me or anything. So that was that was actually more fun than it was scary. The the explosions, although they were loud, but yeah. What yeah, happened? There's always collapse. Didn't you fall? <laughs> didn't you get Didn't you get thrown in the water at one point? Um, you mean during a scene or? No, no. Well, I mean, didn't. And, an accident. Well, the bow, uh, the bow broke while I was on it with Jean, and we were we were sailing. And what happened was the waves were we were really going fast, and the waves um, were really big, so they were like swells. And one came up underneath the bow, and it went snap, and it fell, and then just plunged under. And you know how there's three holes, and then there's a net between, then. We floated right under the net, and then one of the boats that was following us picked us up and took us back back to land. That was weird because all that I saw was underneath the water, and then all these guys jumping in, and you know, right by the net we were under it, and then these guys were sticking their hands through. <laughs> it was funny. You got to work with Kevin. You got to work with uh, Dennis. Can you talk a little bit about working with uh, what you liked about Kevin and what you liked about Dennis? And yeah. Um, I really um, enjoyed working with Kevin he, it, because it's such an honor. He's been in so many, so many great films, and he's such a great actor, and he's so focused and prepared when he's on the set. And he's a really nice man. And Dennis is really cool too because he's he's the greatest villain anybody could ever play. You know, he he just. Um, He's a great actor too, and I was talking to him. And he said he was in the movie with James Dean. I was, wow, you know, this this guy, this this is such an honor because he's been in, in lots of movies too, and he's so talented, and he's he's the sweetest guy you, you'd ever meet. Yeah, Even you as scary looking as he was. He, he, uh, that's that's just his character, but he in real life he he's just the nicest guy. Now you got to realize, Tina, that there aren't many kids your age who knew who, know who James Dean was. <laughs> Well, the first time I think I saw James Dean, pic James Dean's picture was, uh, like in a cafe or something, and I said, "Who's that?" And m my mom explained it to me, and I don't know. <laughs> Tina, what about um, you know Kevin's character is pretty mean to your character in mm -hmm. the movie. Um, did he lighten it up like in other words, right after take the like play with you? I mean, cause, you know, some say some mean stuff to you, your character. Um, my my character. Well. When the cameras was roll, were rolling, he would um, play his character and say mean things to my character. And we knew that we, this was not for for real. It's just just the characters talking, you know. Um, and after the cameras were off, we we there was no more. We wouldn't talk to each other like that. Like <laughs> we just laugh and then you know go back into the scene. So. Um, it was. It wasn't any like um, hard. We it up, hard right? Yeah, we lightened it up. Yeah. Tina, what what did you think the first time you looked in the mirror and saw what they had done to your hair? I thought it was cool. I thought it was. I thought it was a pretty haircut for for my character. I thought it suited her very well. <laughs> what about that tattoo? Was that a temporary tattoo? Um. Yes. It, what the tattoo is uh, a map of of. Uh, dry land, and yes, it was temporary. Did Kevin know he had some big flippers to fill? I mean, after all, your leading man <laughs> previous to him was a uh, seal. Um, uh, <laughs> no, it, it, he, he did, it, we didn't put it that way. He, this, plus, they're, they're, uh, they're both two different kind of species. This is an animal, and then, <laughs> you know, this is this is a human, and you know, these are two different movies, you know. So, 
Yeah. Well, you do seem to like the water, so is the next movie going to be out about water or in the water? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. You're going to stay away from the jellyfish? Yeah. Well, well, you can't help not staying away from the jellyfish because you, if, when you go to Hawaii, if there's a storm on another island, they're going to bring them in anyway. So, you know, you got to take your chances sometimes. Is it three times? <laughs> three times, yep. Three times. Were you able to swim before you started this? Mm -hmm. did, yes. Did you get? Did you take swimming lessons? Or? No, I actually um, I knew how to swim before this, but I had to like we I swam with um, the stunt coordinator and the captain of the trimaran and his kids, and we just would like have little swimming parties and we just swim all over the place. And though we were just swimming for fun, we'd we'd get better and better and better, you know. So that was fun. But I had to get better so that I could pretend that I don't know how to swim. There were there kids there that you could play with and did Kevin's youngsters come over? Mm hmm Yes. Yes. Mm hmm How much time did you actually spend in Hawaii? Six months. I spent six months, yeah. You have a birthday over there? Do you have some Yeah, I actually I didn't have my birthday over in Hawaii. I had my birthday um when we were shooting in LA. Um because in LA we just like I think it was almost my last day, but not quite. So we they baked me a cake. It was really pretty, and um, they gave me balloons and a big card with with everybody's signature all over. It was really cool. Did Kevin give you something special? Well, they all actually they all signed the card, and I got a a, a couple presents and yeah. So when is your birthday? My birthday is February seventh. And um, do you go to regular school, and how old are you? Um, I do go to regular school. I go to a public school, and I'm 10. So you're in fifth grade? I'm going into fifth grade, yeah. So who are some of your favorite actors and influences? You were telling me that, you know, your mom told you about James Dean. Were they big fans as well? And um, you mean who are my idols? Um, I like Jodie Foster and... Um, I like everybody that I've worked with. They're all my my idols, and um, I like lots of people. I like um, Mel Gibson, and you know, uh, I like lots of people. My list goes for days. Who would you most like to work with? Um, there isn't really a person that I would most want to work with. I want to work with a lot of, of people, but you know, it would be a really really good pleasure if I could work with Jody Foster and that would be that would be really neat. Tell us about the support you get from your family and friends in your career. Um well my my family's very supportive of what I what I do and um you know my mom my mom travels with me when I go when I go um on location and you know my dad still works and he's he um real estate owner and my my brother's very supportive and when you've worked with so many movie stars can you be just 10 i mean can you go and just be 10 and go to regular school and and have not have any kid things going on i i, I um uh, yeah i can i can go back to school be a regular kid and you know play do all sorts of stuff with my friends and you know just have fun, yeah. Do you get treated like a movie star at home? I mean, do you have no chores and huge no. allowances? No way, no way. No way. What, how do they treat you? you? They treat me like I'm a regular kid and I'm their kid, so I have lots of chores. And, um, but I'm, I'm glad that I have chores because, because that's what, that's, to help you build a responsibility. How about your friends? Now, now there's this whole line of Waterworld toys. Is there going to be like a, a, an old action figure? Or are you going to have... I don't know. I don't think so. I, I don't know. know they're coming out in mid-August. So uh, what do you think about maybe having your own action figure? Would that, would that be pretty cool? That'd be cool, but I don't know if I'm going to have one or not. I don't I don't think so. But yeah, Tina, this is an action picture, but there's mm -hmm. also a strong environmental message. I think of even the name of your character, Inova. I don't know if you know that name or not, mm -hmm. so where that comes from. That was the name of the plane that dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you think it says to kids your age about, and what do you think about in terms of what's happening to the environment? Um. Well, you mean what? What's the message uh, for me? Um. There's lots of messages, but the one that would be the the easiest one would be that 
this is what could really happen if we don't keep taking care of the planet. And you know, um, even though this is somebody's imagination and this is a movie, you know, this this in real life could happen. You know. What about memorizing all the lines and stuff? Is that easy for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you make a game out of it, or how do you do it? I, I you know, I, I don't know. I think, I, I look at it before I go to bed. Then I wake up and I, I've memorized it um, completely. Then I keep going over it so that I know it, just so that it's in my head going around. You know, I don't know how I do it. I just mem memorize it very easily. Your character is a girl who likes to talk a lot. In fact, she never shuts up. Oh no. Tina, and she really says what's on her mind. Is that? Are you like that? No, no. Mm -mm. This Anola puts it. She just says it how it is for her, you know. But I, I'm not, I'm not that brave to say that kind of stuff, you know. What she, what she says, because. I put it in a nicer way than she does, you know, because <laughs> she just puts it right at you, you know. Do you like Enola better than any of the characters that you know? Well, they're they're all different, um, so, you know, um, actually, you know, they're all different in ways, like not only their names or anything, but their their personalities and stuff. So. I like all of the characters that I've played, but she's pretty much she's pretty much different than every other one that I played. Every part that I play is a lot different than each other. Do you have a favorite the one? Um, no, I I like all of them. I actually I, I like all what of them. What about that just... last scene where you cry and all? What did you <clears> think <throat> about to get the tears starting to come down? Um, actually, when I when I cried, um. I just put myself in Enola's shoes and said, and I had to see what she was feeling, you know, because this guy is going away, and you know that'd be sad if somebody did that to me, you know. So it just naturally comes, you know. Is that part of the fun you talked about liking all the different characters? What's the fun of acting for you of, of becoming a different person? Um, just being able to explore what um what their what their household is like what they live what they live with what their parents are like what what they feel you know um where they live um you know also how how they are and i like to travel you know and and it's yeah that's one of my favorite parts what's your next role i don't know you know there there hasn't been anything i there's nothing come up yet so do you like music Yes, I love music. Tell That's me what you like. I like um you need like what kind of music? Yeah. Um I like classical music. I like um rock and roll. Um I like all sorts of music. I like oh uh, um I like old music. What do you mean old music? Like from the 50s and, you know, 60s. Uh you ever heard the Beatles? Uh huh. Yeah. What go Matt! Go Matt! Go Matt! Go Matt. <laughs> I handed it to you. Oh, all right, fine. <laughs> uh, actually, we're doing a special on the reunion of the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me where you first heard the Beatles and what you thought? You know what? I don't remember where I first heard the Beatles, but I think um, I think they're pretty cool. I, I've only heard them, like, a couple of times, but, you know, I haven't heard all their songs, but... Have you ever been to a concert? You know what? I don't really think so. No. Uh, I don't think so. No, not yet. <laughs> I want to, but... Who would you like to see? You know what? I don't know. <laughs> it, it depends on what kind of... Um, what kind of concert I want to go see, you know. What have you been doing since Waterworld? Oh... Nothing really. Um, I've been just uh, playing with my brother. Um, when did you actually having... finish? When you actually finish Waterworld? When did I actually finish Waterworld? Um, probably in February. Okay, so you've been did playing you... with your brother and going to school and. And yeah, having slumber parties, enjoying my summer, but. Been to any movies? Hmm. Been to any movies? Yeah, I went to. Um, What's good? 
Batman Forever. I love that movie. That's so cool. I want to buy it. <laughs> and um, I saw Congo, which was pretty good. It's scary. She said it's suspenseful. Um, um, I know some of the ones that I've seen are pretty old because I rented them or something like that. Uh, I saw Terminal Velocity, which was really good. I saw that twice. Um, Did you see Casper? Yes, I liked that movie. That was cool. Um, and Pocahontas? No, I haven't seen that yet. I I, I haven't seen. Oh, I haven't seen that much. Well, so. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get seasick? Yeah, four times I got seasick. Twice on the top of the eighth hole because the farther up you get, the more it like goes back and forth. Um. Uh, then the other two times I got sick on the train run. What, what did you do anything to fight back against being seasick, or what? Did, did they give you anything? No, you know, it, it just sort of, you know, happens sometimes. So and the way I kept from getting seasick was, um, like, you know, just running around. That helps me stop. So I try to do that as much as I can. So you know, Kevin was in here and he said some really nice things about you. And one of the things that he described is when he had you in his arms, then you flew across on the rope. Oh, that was cool, yeah. Could you talk about being held in his arms and flying across the sky on that a That was rope? cool, yeah. Well, um, we had fun, but it was, it, it was, it was, um, it was just like, you know, flying. You just push, he pushed off and we were gone, you know. That was really cool because, you know, you have the, just, you know, it, it was so nice, um, the water hits your feet because we went like around and then you know your the your feet go in the water and um, it was sort of it was sort of funny because we were both a little bit nervous so like um, but he but he said you know if anything were to happen you know we'll we'll be together you know because we were hooked together so that's what makes us nervous you know hook hooked together if anything were to happen we'd be stuck you know so that if he were to swim i'd be dragging along you know and so um that that made me feel secure you know just being with him and um having him hold me on the side you know that made me feel secure is he funny i mean did you guys with, i mean because you had so many scenes with him i mean is he funny mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, we we had lots of fun together. Yeah. What about was there you know any? It, there was a lot of pressure on the set because it was an expensive movie. Um, was there some fun though, where you got to kind of hang with Kevin and Dennis and just you know? Oh yeah, all uh, most of the, yeah. We we had lots of time, and um, you know the only reason that you know we don't really think of the movie as being like the most expensive. It's more of you know the biggest film ever made and the only reason is because we're shooting on water you know so that's the reason any particular fun events that you recall you guys got to kind of laugh or play play jokes on each other anything like that oh we we didn't play jokes on each other i don't think but we we used to talk all the time and joke around just like we'd sit together and um while we were waiting and you know have fun was it like when you see yourself on the big screen? Do you kind of go, what was I doing there? Or? No, I, I like it. I like watching myself on the screen. Yeah. Tina, what's your favorite show on Fox Kids? <laughs> you know what? Fox Kids. I have so many favorite shows on that. Um, Let's see. I forget what's on it, though. Tick, Spider-Man, Batman and Robin, Eek. Eek the Cat. That's cool. Eek. Yeah, Eek. Um... Oh, I forget what that show is called. I watched it the other yesterday. Animaniacs. Isn't it three? Is it the three D? Animaniacs. Not. Carmen San Diego. That one's cool. Um, I forget the other one though. No, there was Animaniacs. another one. Not Animaniacs. Uh, I don't remember it. <laughs> I don't remember it. <laughs> if one of your friends at school were to come up and say, "I want to be an actor," what would you tell them? Um, I would say that's great, cause you know it's up to them if they want to be an actor. That's 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 great. That's great. Do you have any advice for them? Um, I just tell them that you really have to want to do it. It's hard work, of course. Um, but there is a lot of fun, 
things to do. You have to travel, you know, but it's still hard work. You know? Have you seen any parts of this movie? Mm -hmm. I saw I saw the movie, but it wasn't 100% finished. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you saw it all, most of it put together? I loved it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's it like when you meet kids your age from other countries? Because you said you like to travel a lot and you get to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. What's that like when you go to other countries? You know what? I've only been to one other country, and that's the, like, like that's the only place I've been is Canada, which isn't really that far. So, um, actually, I didn't really meet any kids there. So, well, I did, but they they were all actors on Andre, which was really cool. So we got to be friends there. So. Do you get gonna recognized do at all? I mean, like fans come up and want your autograph and stuff, or yeah, it's fun. Really? Yeah. Like going through a mall or something, people will just come up and. Uh... Mm hmm. They say, "Aren't you Andre?" or something like that. You know, it's, it's funny. Are you gonna do another Andre? Is there an Andre too? I don't know. I don't know. Are they talking about it? I don't know. Tina, have you been following what the media's been saying about this movie? About how it's, they're much more excited about what, how much it costs rather than what it's about. You mean, am I happy with it? Well, just what's your opinion? Um, I don't think they should be worrying about how much expense, how much, how much it costs. You know, it should be more about going to the movie to enjoy the movie, and just, you know, this. The only reason it's this expensive is because we're shooting on water and we've got all these boats and stuff. And you know, um, they should just go to the movies to enjoy it and you know get into it and you know. Just don't worry about it, you know? How did you get into movies in the first place? You know what? I don't really know. I asked, I, I begged my mom to be an actress, and um, I started in a dancing group, then I went into commercials, then I did the TV series, and I did One of Man's Woman. So that was my first movie, and yeah. Great one to start in, too. Mm -hmm. That's a movie. Nice yeah. piece of work. Yeah, it was. Do you have a computer? Mm hmm. Do you have, yeah. Do you go online? Um, yeah. That's cool. Is it fun? What's, what's fun about it? Um, well, like when I need help with my homework, I can go to, like, kids only or something. You go to the dictionary and you can do all sorts of stuff. You can send mail and you can keep in touch with people. It's really cool. Yeah. You can hear the news and, you know, um, Disney adventures, you know, all sorts of stuff. That's cool. Did you ever see your side, yourself on the other side of the camera and stay doing directing or anything like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to direct when I get older. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lot of work. I know. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a video camera? Are you shooting anything when, you know, when you're hanging around? or? Yeah, my, my, my dad has to be there, though, because no, none of us know how to use a camera. <laughs> Only my dad does, so, yeah. <laughs> so he's your DP? Yeah. Tina, is, is there a, a, a video a movie that you've seen a million times or every word to that you've seen it over and over? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's lots of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw the one that I, I know almost every word to is The Mask. Because I've seen that like 21 times. That's, that's one of my favorite movies. Absolute favorite. Your yeah. favorite line from that movie would be? Oh, all of them. <laughs> I like all of them, but I mean, I don't know. Why is that your favorite movie? Just because, you know, all the computer stuff that they did, the ma the mask that he wears, the story, how silly he is. You know, it's a really funny movie. Just all the jokes and stuff. Like to work with Jim Carrey, maybe? Mm. Well, maybe. Yeah. I like to meet him. That's definitely, yeah. There's a lot of controversy that's been surrounding this movie about budgets and stuff like that. I Were you aware of that at all, Tina? I mean, the fact that this, you know, this movie has been controversial and that there's been a lot written about it, big budget, production and trouble and all that, or were you just, did that? I knew about it, yeah, but there wasn't, see, we don't really think of it as being, this is just a big movie, you know, this is just a big movie, and um, I'm really glad that we made it because we're, we're, we're part of, we're all part of the, the biggest movie ever made in history, and you know, um, there, you mean the troubles on the set? There wasn't that many. There wasn't trouble on the set, but I mean, um, it's just uh, I don't know. People, I don't know. <laughs>
people like to write about things I know. that are necessarily true? Um, I don't know about that, but, you know, I think, I don't know, they just wrote stuff. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank Tina. You, Tina. You're welcome. Okay, and we're back from Tina Majorino. We are. I've, I've got a postscript. Yeah. And it's one I've been wanting to get off my chest for a long time. Gail Murphy asked Tina whether or not there was talk of an Andre 2, you know, a sequel to that movie about Tina and a seal. Sure. This was not just a stalling technique to get another question, and Gail really wanted to know. And I can say this with authority because 23 years later, she still brings it up every time I see her. Where's Andre 2? As if I would know. It's just a thing with her. She's obsessed with Andre. <laughs> Uh, no, my real postscript. Tina said that she wanted to direct when she gets older. She is older now, but so far no directing. She does still act, though. And we never really talked about who she is, her acting credits. Greg, you want to... I mean, her acting this? credits is just she's basically best known for that movie Napoleon Dynamite. Vote you for know, Pedro. Vote for, vote for Pedro. Uh, but she's cut her teeth, other than Napoleon Dynamite, she's cut her teeth in, in various TV shows. Um, you've probably seen her in Grey's Anatomy. Scorpion, Veronica Mars. She was in the pink video, Effing Perfect. She was the, the lead mm. in that one. Okay. So she's actually had a, a solid television career, never became the A-list movie star. But the, the key in these things is to actually carve out a very solid, I mean, obviously she was, she was in True Blood as well. So she's had, and she continues, continues to work on a regular clip. So she's doing just fine. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so moving right along, next we have Jean Triplehorn, who plays Helen. Jean, of course, who was so great on HBO's Big Love. I never watched Criminal Minds, but that was the most recent high-profile thing that she did from 2012 to 2014. Greg, right. uh, what else would we know her from? That's pro probably pretty much... The Firm? The Firm. I mean, around, the, around this time, Basic Instinct... You know, she talks about right, that. Of course, of she, course. she talks about that in the interview. At, at this moment in time, she was a a go to leading actress as far as cinema goes. But again, she's had a, a long career. This is at the beginning of her career. Hence, the questions about life with then then uh, then soulmate Ben Stiller. But she actually, I think that they had just broken up, but it was still a pretty recent thing. A recent thing, but she still. There was a Ben Stiller question within the interview that she answers, maybe towards the end, if I recall. Yeah, yeah. She, she's evasive about it for a little while. She kind of talks about, you know, how tough relationships are without naming names. And then I think it's Shep who asks about Ben Stiller by name. Specifically. Okay. Yeah. Because remember, these were the years before the internet. So most of us just knew what was on the press notes. If it wasn't in the notes, we didn't know it. Shep Morgan was always a great guy who would do outside research and would come in and would ask about things. And we would all kind of go, oh, great. Glad you knew that. I didn't know that. And he would get really good stuff out of them. So, yeah, Shep is the one who asks her about Ben Stiller. And thank you, Shep. Yeah. OK, so at, at this moment, Waterworld was, even though she started in Reality Bites, uh, like you said, The Firm, Basic Instinct huge film but Waterworld was a was a really big tentpole film probably her first and, and only tentpole film uh for for gene triple home triple horn cinema wise but in, in the interview she'll also mention just as a tease she also mentions a lot the an, a movie called till there was you and we'll get to a little bit about that on right. the postscript for gene triple horn yeah and i wanted to give you guys a heads up we've got a beep edit which we haven't had a little in a little while but if you're new to the show, just to explain what this is. And this is like right at the end, like 30 seconds before the interview finishes. We recorded these interviews on cassette tape because this was the mid 90s and that's what the technology was. And what would happen was there would only be 50 minutes per side. And we would kind of assume that we could fit two people on a side and it would, you know, the interview would end before the tape would, and then we would fast forward to the end and flip it over and start fresh on the next side. Sometimes the interviews ran a little longer than that, and we weren't expecting that. So we would be right in the middle of an interview, and all of a sudden, the tape recorder in front of us would pop up, and we'd go, oops, and we'd very quickly flip the tape over and hit record, and we would have missed about 10 or 15 seconds. So rather than taking out entire bites, you know, where we would be losing, like, three or four minutes of the interview. I didn't want to do that. So instead, we just 
put a little beep that signifies there's a little bit of a chunk missing here. Not too much, but that's what that is. So hopefully it won't be too disorienting. You will hear a beep edit. Okay. With, without further ado, here is, with the beep edit, Gene Triplehorn. Really you and the all together that we saw. The, what, what? In the what? Without the clothes. No, that was not me. That wasn't you. No, that was not me. Was that in your contract that you wouldn't do that? No, it was in my integrity. Uh, I felt that that was a really gratuitous scene and that it could sh- be shot um, a little more creatively. And it was kind of a standoff between myself and the directors and the producers. Um, they, I, ke- I, I think for a while they, they really thought I would kind of capitulate and finally doff my duds. But um, I didn't, and so when it came uh, time to film it, I, I said, well, if we are, if you insist on doing this shot, you're not going to be creative, then um, then I have to pick my double. Um, it's going to be my derriere there. And um, so I did. And do you want to know how? How many <laughs> <did you> audition? <laughs> All right. No, um, how many did you audition? <laughs> Um, uh, three. We had three finalists, and they were in a trailer, um, and they said, uh, Jean, uh, your ladies are waiting. So I walked into a trailer. They all had terry cloth robes on, and they turned around, and I said, ladies, drop. And uh, they dropped their robes, and I was so embarrassed that I just went with the best one, you know, with I, I just kind of had derriere instinct, and went with um, the one that you see on camera. Well, you were more powerful than Mel Gibson because when he made movies, he had no um, choice whatsoever and whose who's butt they used it all. And we remember talking to him, he was horrified. Yeah. He said, I want to clear the air right now. Oh, yeah. That wasn't mine. No, the, the, you know, Chuck Gordon, they were all, I, they were really great about That's that. Really but being in a position to pick the person you're going to send out to do the thing that you... But I think that's fair. I mean, it, it, this person is representing me on film. I, it's, I, to me, I, I don't understand how Mel Gibson, how that even happened. That somebody, that's supposed to be you. The audience is to believe that that's you. You, you did say that you felt it's gratuitous. Uh, how tough is it to avoid that, though? Well, I thought for this particular film, I obviously, after having made Basic Instinct, I don't have a problem with nudity in the right context and in the right forum, in the right genre, in the right audience. And this was a big summer movie, and young people were going to be seeing it in the, like, 10, I mean, I think we got a PG-13, didn't we? So, you know, a lot of, of young kids would be seeing it, and I just felt it was, it could be shot, I, I just felt they could be more creative and, and still convey the story. A lot has been said about this movie, um, and we keep hearing more and more that really? most of it wasn't true. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I know. It's strange. We just found out about it today, actually. Um, but there was one quote attributed to you that suggested that at times you felt like Patty Hearst mm-hmm. in this movie. Is that true, and if so, in what way? Well, after month four of what was supposed to be a three and a half to four month shoot, uh, you just realized that you had to get through it, and it was uh, you know playing mind tricks, you know, and and humor was a big help in getting through it. We would start the day off. I think in month five we started tricking ourselves, you know, that we were filming Waterworld two, that we were already on the second movie, and then about month six and seven we were doing the TV series, and we just would kind of trick ourselves that way. It was really funny at the point. But at that time, it was really, really rigorous. Everybody lost a lot of weight, and uh, we were constantly moving. You were constantly moving to get to the set, and then once you were on the set, you were on a boat or the atoll. You were always having to maintain balance, so you never, ever, ever stopped moving. You brought a new meaning to wet kissing, getting air from Kevin <laughs> underwater. It was what was that scene? I mean, you've been kissed by leading men before, but uh-huh. I mean, that must have been a weird scene to do. Yeah, it, well, it wasn't a romantic kiss, it was the kiss of life, and it was really, I mean, precarious doesn't even begin to describe um, kind of how difficult it was, because it, the, originally, I think we filmed it twice, we filmed it um, the, the first time in the ocean, uh, in 50 feet of water, uh, with a 30-foot scaffolding uh, kind of anchored to the ocean floor, and then we went down 20 feet, and it, there were straps uh, on the scaffolding for us to hook our feet under, uh, so we wouldn't float away. 
and uh, um, Kevin Costner and I, when we when we uh, were on the water, kind of approaching the point of submersion, you know, we were out there, kind of going to the set. We were on surfboards, so we would kind of surf our way out to where we were supposed to submerge. And I had a diving buddy alongside of me, and and he had my regulator. Uh, I was wearing a, a a wig, and I had makeup on, so I couldn't wear a mask. So I had to keep my eyes closed on my way to the scaffolding. Um, so all I had, I had my eyes closed, and I was. I, was, I had the hand of my diving buddy, and I had a regulator, and they floated me down. They, with my eyes closed, they hooked my feet under the strap. Kevin Costner was already down there waiting for me, and um, I could hear they had a speaker underwater with Kevin Reynolds saying, "Okay, you ready?" And they could see us through the camera, and uh, they would give us a count of five, and he'd say, "You know, you ready? Yes, count of five. And on, I think the third count, my diving buddy took my breath away, and he had to move. So he wasn't seen um, on film, so he moved about 10 feet away from me, and then we had 10 seconds to film it. That's as long as our breath would really last. And so they counted while we're doing this scene. They would just, I would just hear them four, five, six, and then we're trying to do, you know, to do all the technical um, movements, and then. Of course, it was all about, by count eight, it was all about just getting that breath to me, getting that regulator into my mouth. Did they really so, cover this in Juilliard when you, when you were studying? I skipped all my swimming classes, so, and now I'm paying for it. Did you find yourself at some point, I'm sure you found yourself many times, but in the middle of going, what am I doing? Mm-hmm, yeah, what happened? <laughs> what, I, yeah. But after a while, you just have to get through it. And I knew it was going to be a really different film, um, a different story, a different look. And we were creating such a world that I knew in the long run that it would be really gratifying because people are seeing something that they haven't seen that isn't all computer generated. Did you have an option at four months <coughs> to leave? I mean, no, I was, <laughs> no. But, but I mean, what, what stipulation? I could have it. I could leave, but I wouldn't have a career. <laughs> Were you well, good what, do they make stipulations saying you must stay to the end of the shoot, shoot if it takes six months? Or I would have, yeah, I mean, I would have stayed until I wanted it to be a good film and I wanted it to be on film. <laughs> so, um, you know, things could have been different, but we were filming on water and water is not always complying with sort of a production schedule. It's not always, I mean, the whole entire production took on I've said it before, but you know the entire production took on all the characteristics of water, every every facet of it. Would you ever do another film on water? I don't think there'll be another film made on water for a while after this. Well, well you <laughs> spent a lot of time with, with Kevin. How did he hold up? I mean, the, the pressure that he must have been under and still having to act and deliver a performance on the set every day. Well. I mean, everybody had their own pressures. We were out. We were we were all really far away from home, and and the film was was you know it was kind of a war trying you know every day was kind of a battle trying to like get something on film. Um, I think he you know was amazing. I think everybody was amazing out there, really, because everybody had their own life goes on when you make a film. It doesn't stop, which I've learned in the last four or five years that you know you can be in the middle of a film and. You know, your life doesn't stop. Your private life doesn't stop, and your family doesn't stop going. You know, doing what they're doing, and and that affects you. So you just have to look at it as as your your work, and and you just can't stop. Right did you off the top of my head, I can think of three you? really great actors that you've co-starred with: Val Kilmer and uh, Tom Cruise and um, Kevin Costner. Could you talk a little bit about these wonderful three wonderful actors? Um, they're all, they're three wonderful actors. I mean, they're all, uh, uh, they're obviously in it for the long haul and, and, uh, I've learned a lot from them. They've always been open with, uh, since, since I haven't done a lot of films, they've always been really open with, with, uh, and forthright about, you know, giving wisdom and, and, you know, the, and telling me the pitfalls that they've faced and, you know, what I can avoid. What makes each one of them a unique individual as an actor? I mean, you see it. I mean, they're 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 three different people. I'm a different person. They're they're three different people. So, do you want specifically like each one? Yeah. Um, I mean, Michael Douglas is. Uh, they're all they're all really really smart smart men, you know, and and they work very hard. Um, I don't know how to answer it. I mean, they're all. Well, like 
Tom, for example, uh, or Val, for example, or Michael, or... I mean, I'm interested I mean, that would take a long you. time to really go into in depth. I mean, you yeah. see it on screen. They're all different. They're all very good, and I'm really lucky to have worked with them. So, in turn, what is your strongest attribute as an actor, in your opinion? Mm, the ability to stay focused in the middle of chaos. Whatever, you know, chaos in different forms, different levels, different films have, you know, all had their sort of chaotic elements. When you first saw the script, what were you going to say? I was going to say, in, ter in, in terms of that chaos, um, did you witness any of those kind of breakdowns, be it because of the problems with the movie or because of emotional pressure? And did you yourself ever kind of reach a breaking point? And what was that? Well, did I witness what breakdowns Just between anybody, the Kevins or anything? Um, no. At one point. I think people did their own breaking down in the privacy of their own home. I mean, the what I thought was really amazing, and it's not even a cliche, oh, the crew is great. Um, Dean Simler, the cinematographer, we were um, we were out on the trimaran one day, and we were I think probably six months into it, and he, you know, he's worked you know on water before, and he's worked with you know kind of productions that have uh, that have taken on like, you know, this sort of life of it, life of their own, life of its own, and he said it was really amazing to have worked on on this movie, and nobody had snapped, you know, we had been out on this boat, this small boat out at sea. No, not not one crew member and not one cast person snapped and just I can't take it anymore. Nobody did that. So she's such a strong character. She's such a strong in-your-face character. Uh, tell me about the fun of playing someone like that and how much is she like you in any way? Mm, I when I when I first got the role, I kind of I really worked on her on <laughs> land. Um, and you know worked on her while I was out here and kind of uh, and sort of did my homework before I got out there and then once I got out onto sea I realized that I was a lot more like her because off camera uh, just you know the rigors of, of, of filming it um, were much like the rigors of what this character was going through to save her child so I realized that there were you know there was a similarity in just that endurance um, um, that that we both had to just kind of get through it. Is it important for you to play those kinds of non-meek sort of? No, I, I I mean I hope as an actor and as I go along I'll play all sorts of women, women that aren't strong in the face of adversity. But um, I think it's always great for you know women especially to see strong women up on screen. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I don't think I've ever seen a movie where the strong heroine got smacked <coughs> around by the hero mm -hmm. so much in one film. Well, I think I smacked him back and I don't know if that made it into the movie, but there, you know, there were a couple of times that I smacked back. Um, and also this particular world was not really nice to women and children. Um, I, maybe if it was a contemporary world, I probably wouldn't have even taken the role because I thought it would have been ridiculous and I wouldn't have agreed with it. But this particular world was dog eat dog, and women's rights had sort of disappeared along the way, and it was all about surviving. And you know, men just happened to be kind of the dominant um, gender, and and um, and it kind of just made sense. This is not Gloria Steinem's future. Apparently. No, it's not a future that I would like for my daughter. No. Gee, when you what first is saw your the next script, project? it's a romantic comedy, uh, "Till There Was You," and it's um, very smart uh, comedy written by Winnie Holtzman and directed by Scott Winant, and they're kind of the force behind my so-called life. So it's uh, it's going to be very funny, and they really write um, women well. And Dylan McDermott is set. That happened this week, and um, it's kind of a a story about two people who inadvertently affect each other in order to meet and fall in love. What when you first when saw the Waterworld script, did any flag go up at all of warning you where you thought there could be a problem here or it might be difficult there? No, when I first read it, I thought it was really the most interesting script that I had read, but it wasn't something I personally wanted to do because I wanted to do a smaller film um, kind of involving women characters and, um, you know, uh, a woman director and just kind of wanted to be in, in a more intimate kind of production. And so when I met Kevin Reynolds, you know, I had 
perfect faith in, in him and um, Kevin Costner that, that they could pull this thing off because mainly their temperaments. They both have very, I mean, Kevin Costner has an edge to him, but overall, they both have these easygoing, you know, Kevin Reynolds is from Texas, and there's a really mellow temperament. And I thought, well, if I did a movie like this, these would be the people to do it with because nobody's going to blow. Um, these aren't, you know, he's not the kind of director who's going to be so frustrated with the water and the wind that he's going to, you know, use the actors as whipping boys. And, um, and so, you know, initially I didn't know want to do this but then funding for my movie pulled through and they had heard about it and called back and said would you reconsider coming back in and and I did and a week later I was in Hawaii. What happened when the bow collapsed? Uh, the bow spread collapsed? Yeah. Um, it was rigged for a stunt and they forgot that when they when we were out at sea and we were just it was a pleasure trip I, I'm sure Tina told you about it it was a Tina and I uh, Tina Majorino plays um, my uh, child we were out on the boat as a pleasure trip. They had said we should kind of get out on the boat and the atoll to acclimate ourselves and get used to it since we were going to be on it for a long time. And we were out there having fun on the bowsprit and the waves were really, really rough and um, and, and we were laughing and, and the pin that was holding the bowsprit into the boat because the waves were so rough, it fell out. And I heard somebody say, look out, and somebody kind of ran up behind us because the bowsprit was collapsing. And if we were on it, we would have, um, our feet would have uh, caught in the wiring and we would have been dragged under the boat and, and drowned. So one of the safety guys just pushed us out into the water and we both kind of were pushed under the, the hull and popped up and, and Tina didn't know how to swim at the time and was uh, panicking, was screaming for her mother and, and a number of safety engineers swam in after us but I swam to Tina and that was kind of our bonding experience. We didn't even have to act anymore. <laughs> you know, the mother and child roles were kind of set and, and, and so it happened for a reason, I guess. They had her out there and she couldn't though, swim. She's on the, the, bow, the bow or something. She and she waves and she can't. She had a life jacket on. No, I. That's one of the ironies of film that you would cast a child who doesn't swim in a movie called Waterworld. But she started swimming a week after that, <laughs> so she, it was. She got on the ball. You registered a moment ago. You said that the kiss scene, the, that underwater kiss of life scene, was done twice. Was there a different type of production the second time? Well. I, I think the water I, was murky the first time around that we did it, um, and so they got some shots, but. Um, you know, it was it was really tricky filming underwater, so we moved to the McDonnell Tuggles tank, which is like one atmosphere of 33 feet of water. And it was very fun. That was really it was so much fun to film in that because it was all controlled and it was 98 degrees. It was like bath water, so that was really fun. You you recently said that uh, you 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 were in a situation where you were by a pool and everyone's swimming with you and you're sitting here in the sun and you literally did not go in the water. Have, mm -hmm. have you gotten over that yet? Um, I'm getting there. I mean, there were times, I mean, I just, I, we were in the water so much um, for this film that I felt like I had dishpan body. I mean, I was just like wrinkled and I just didn't have any desire to get back in. And now I'm kind of, I'm taking baths again and, you know, but before it was all like, turn the shower water on and I called it just taking a bird bath. I just like <laughs> run in and, you know, I just water mm, like beaches and just did it for a long time. And boats, I have no desire to go on a boat for a while. No cruises, no, you know, love boat, no nothing. Nothing. When you, you go back to the very first time you ever saw yourself on screen? <laughs> uh, I thought plastic surgery. Um, but I'm not, I never will. Um, it's hard to look at, I mean, you know, it's hard to look in the mirror. I mean, anybody, I don't think, I don't know many people who enjoy kind of being a bird in a cage and looking at themselves in the mirror. I mean, well, what attracted you to acting then? Um, well, I always had a big imagination as a kid, so it's nice to be paid for it now. You know, I still have a big imagination, but now I try to keep it on screen and not off. How I about being the TV and radio sensation? Also, <laughs> can you talk a little bit? Well, yes, I will. Um, it was a great, it was a great training ground. It was really, you know, I was in radio. Um, I think I was like the youngest female DJ when I was 16 in the States, in America. And um, I started part-time and then I moved to weekends at a FM radio station <clears throat> in Tulsa, rock and roll radio station, um, album rock to be specific. And, um, and 
And then I moved to Morning Drive, so I had my own morning show. And then um, along the way, I started doing these local TV shows, and I would interview rock bands when they came in town, like Cheap Trick and Toto. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was great. And then I started doing comedy, really what I call no-shame comedy. Um, Tulsa was so good to me, you know, to give me all of this opportunity and to really kind of put up with whatever I was up to at whatever given time. Um, and it helped when I moved to New York. There was it was a really smooth transition, and I had all this experience. I mean, then that's why stuff like this doesn't really surprise me because we were just when I was in Tulsa doing those TV shows, we were filming, you know, with no budget and you know, filming in locations where nobody wanted us. We'd have to run in there and, you know, use a bank or something. And we have a security guard telling us to get out. And we're, oh, you don't understand. And we're trying to, to do it all under, you know, this is all nothing compared to the difficulties of filming in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So when Water. The water was set when you were thinking, God, I wish I was back in radio. No. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's kind of fun to, to, to be out behind the mic. But it was also, what's great about radio is like I didn't have to, I, I think I, I had to work after my prom and I was really sick. And I, I was um, at a Sunday morning radio show and, and uh, I think it was, yeah, I was like 17, 18 years old. And I was so sick. But I knew all the seven minute and longer songs like, you know, Free Bird and Won't Get Fooled again and so I knew all the bathroom songs and um and so I was really green because I'd really gotten drunk the night before on my prom and I had a headache and I was really hung over and so I would put on one like free bird followed by you know and would run to the bathroom and get sick so something's like never changed really actually <laughs> what? something's never changed I know I know <laughs> we used to put on live albums oh yeah or how about Inagata De Vida? Right. yeah there thank you right. live right. drum solo uh huh <laughs> maybe three three breakthrough moments in your in your career thus far I mean really um um well, Basic Instinct was obviously, I owe Paul Verhoeven everything for taking a chance. Um, I actually think these three films have been, you know, breakthroughs career-wise for me. You know, The Firm, they were all taking a chance on me, I think. And um, and I'm always I'm grateful. What, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, I listen to all kinds. I think in my... In my CD player right now, I've got Hole, um, Live Through This, um, Bob Wills, Texas Playboys, and Beastie Boys, and Henry Mancini, soundtrack from Two for the Road. That's kind of what I've got in there right now. Something for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned you thought all three of those directors had taken a chance mm -hmm. on you. Is there going to be a point where you stop thinking that directors are taking a chance? I think this next one. I'm ready. Till there was you. I think I'm. I, I'm ready. And it's in a. Like I said, it's, it's comedy. It's something I feel really comfortable in. And and this director, I feel really, really, really comfortable with. I think um, it's and it's a low budget, so I'm not going to have that pressure of having to to prove myself. Is, is stage work behind you now, or do you? Hope to stage? No, I'd love to get back um, to the theater. It's. You know, finding something really interesting, and you commit. I mean, I mean, in film, you you really commit your life to it. But in theater, your life revolves around an 8 p.m. curtain, um, and it has to be something really, really, really that I feel. You know, it's something that I really feel passionate about. Kevin. With experience both on stage and and in front of the camera, what do you get from one that you don't get from the other? The difference to an actor. Um, I think I get the intimacy. You know, in film. Um, I like that, that sort of the, the the intimacy, and I think film for me is much more difficult than um, than theater. It's really. Kevin was here earlier talking about how making this movie um, really took its toll on his other life. Mm -hmm. um, and he was really great. Mm -hmm. He brought his kids in. It was really great. Did you have a similar experience? Did it take a hole and connect with your other life as well? You mean the the, the film starts to kind of bleed into your personal life yeah, and the way? Yeah. You mean like this? You mean the story or just the fact that we were on location well, the, and so far the away and all the notoriety, the press writing stories that wasn't true, being gone for so long? Yeah, yeah, those do take a toll on your relationships. You know, your personal relationships and your family and your friends because I mean, on this particular one, you know, a you were far away. 
and you couldn't just jump on a plane. Sometimes, you know, it, it's easy to kind of jump on a plane with air travel like it is. You can just get on a plane and you can be there in a number of hours. But that was a really, really, you know, grueling kind of, you know, long flight. But it was also you were so physically tired at the end of the day, it was hard to communicate anyway. I mean, and then you were off, you know, time schedule, trying to like call home or, or whatever, you were kind of off a little bit, but you were exhausted. So it was hard, you know, relationships and, you know, relationships with your family and your friends, it all takes work. When you say you, do you mean you or do you mean? I mean everybody. I mean, I think everybody who works in film uh, or, or anybody who's devoted and dedicated to what they're doing, you put a lot of energy into that and sometimes the energy balance is off and you're putting more of your energy into what you're doing and you know, we were out there, it was all I could do to get on a boat every day and, and, and do my work and sort of save my energy for that than to you know, get on the phone and, and keep up relationships and you know. I mean, it's it's hard. It was um, with a, another filmmaker, and I don't know. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't try to plan anything anymore. No, no. Well, talking about relationships, I mean, it's it's just looking at all the press attention your relationship with Ben got. Isn't it just hard to have a relationship? Period in this business. Yeah, it is. With it's all the transient. It? Yeah, it's a really transient business, so it's kind of hard to. You know, but it's but it's easy. It's easier sometimes if you have somebody who is in the business and who understands the, you know, constraints and. You just try to grin and bear it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's gonna have to be our last. Thank question. you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So that was Jean Triplehorn. It's interesting that she talked about the film Till There Was You, which she was getting ready to start filming. This junket took place in July 1995, and Till There Was You didn't come out until May 1997, which is a full two years later. So it kind of makes me wonder, did that film sit on the shelf for a little while, or maybe they weren't able to start filming as quickly as she thought they would? I don't know the answer, but I am curious. I also found it interesting when she said that acting on film has an intimacy that acting in theater doesn't, because usually when actors talked about this, they said the opposite. You know, what we heard a lot in interviews was that, you know, for actors who did a lot of theater, they would say that having an audience in the room with them in a theater, giving an immediate response is much more intimate. So I'm sorry that she didn't talk more about that. I'd be interested to hear why her thinking is kind of the opposite of what we would normally hear. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting. Yeah. That was her perspective on it. Well, that is Gene Triplehorn. Next up is Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. We've covered him before with True Romance. That is right. And if you're curious, you can go back and listen to it there. For now, I think we'll probably just say that he was an iconic actor and a prolific director, probably best remembered for 1969's Easy Rider and is the villain in Speed and Victor Drazen in the first season of 24. And he died in May 2010 from prostate cancer at the age of 74. So, as we did in so, so many junkets, we will be starting now with me asking that damn Beatles question. So, go ahead, Matt. Ask the damn Beatles question. Dennis, before we start, I've got something out of left field. i got to get out of the way now rather than yeah. disrupt the flow later. Yeah. We're doing a show on the Beatles reunion. Do you remember uh, where you were when you first heard the Beatles and what you thought? When I first heard the Beatles and what I thought. Wow. No. <laughs> if you can remember, you're not the Dennis Hopper we know. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I mean, you know, what year was that? 61? 62? Before he was born, anyway. You just did the show. <laughs> well, oh, you like, just, you <laughs> might not have heard them until later. <laughs> no, no, no I, I, well, I heard them before they came into the country. Uh, I mean, they made a, a big movement. Into, I mean, there was a big... Uh, 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 Wasserman was the press agent for them, and he brought them in. Uh, I can't remember what years it was. I I can't remember the first song. I'm trying to remember what the first song was I could have heard. I don't know, but I liked them immediately. I thought they were I thought they were terrific. It took me a long time to like enjoy the Rolling Stones, very honestly, because I thought they were always emulating the Beatles, even though they had a much different. Uh, Sensibility. It took me a lot longer to appreciate the Stones. What music do you listen to now? Um, God, I listen to all kind of music, but I, I'm revisiting jazz right at the moment because jazz was really important to me as a young man. 
and uh, yeah, I'm listening to a lot of jazz. Could you tell us why? We important. do a jazz show. I'm just curious to know why uh, jazz has a particular appeal for you. Ben. Well, I always felt that jazz was the the greatest uh, contribution America ever made to music. You know, and I I, I still feel that, and. Uh, I had a lot of friends who were jazz musicians. Uh, Miles Davis was a friend of mine from the time I was like 17 years old, and uh, I just had a lot of friends. Uh, Leroy Vinegar, I don't remember if you know him or not, bass player. He just sent me an album of his. He's up in uh, Portland, Oregon. He's got a club up there now and so on. And I just had a lot of friends, and I was always interested in it. I remember Bob Rafelson one time said uh, that if Miles Davis hadn't turned his back on the audience, it would have taken the Beatles five years longer before they invaded. Yeah, that uh, jazz was really an incredible moment. It had an incredible moment, and then it just rock and roll just kicked it out and uh, disappeared. Except in Europe, it's very big right now. Does what jazz is figure, into, figure into ba is it Basquiat? Is that how you pronounce it? Jean uh, Jean Michel Basquiat. Yeah, does, does jazz the black figure into, that? Uh, into that into that thing. Well, Jean Michel listened to a lot of jazz. I don't know whether Julian Schnabel will put a lot of jazz in the music and into the movie as music or not, but. Uh, uh, the artist himself listened to a lot of jazz when he painted. And your role? In that? And he painted a lot of things about Charlie Parker, about Bird and uh, Bird Lives and so on. I'm playing an art dealer, uh, John, uh, Bruno Bischoberger. Uh, he was the one that was uh, Swiss German, who was responsible for Basquiat, uh, his career really basically as an artist, and then later getting Andy Warhol and Basquiat to do their, the final paintings they did together before they died. We sort of um, kind Dennis, of could you this. talk a little bit about, um, uh, I don't know if the word is challenge or not, but the, uh, the task of, for you personally about playing um, characters that are not so much bigger than life, but certainly left of center. Yeah, what, what do you want to know about them? Um, is, it, is, is that a challenge for you? Is that fun for you? Is that something you always look to do? Does it come naturally? Because it seems to. Uh, well, you know, through the years I've been asked this question, and through the years I've rationalized various answers. My latest answer to this is, when I was a young man, by the time I was 13 to 18, I played Shakespeare, you know, at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. And when, if you play Shakespeare, who are the great parts that you want to play? They're all insane people. They're all crazy. From Hamlet to, like, King Lear to Macbeth, to Othello, to Iago, to Richard III, to Henry V. They're all batso, you know, totally batso. So I say, well, you know, those are the parts I wanted to play as a young man, so it's only natural that I go into movies. I came into movies to be a leading man, not to be a character actor and not to be a, a villain. However, I don't want to give up my day job, you know what I mean? And I really enjoy playing villains, and I really think that I'm doing them well. And um, I, I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy working as an actor. I love acting. I feel very privileged that I, uh, and I will never forget how privileged a life I lead as an actor. It has drawbacks, but uh, um, one of them is you never know whether you're ever going to work again because you have no steady job, you have no given income, you don't know how much you're going to make from one year to the next. But you can't right? possibly still suffer from that, Dennis? Of course, of course. I don't have any income except my livelihood. You know, I don't, I didn't invest in a lot of like, you know, land or whatever. I mean, I, I go from job to job and work, uh, you know, that way. Is it natural for an actor not to lose that sense of insecurity? <coughs> I, don't think, I don't think an actor ever loses it. I mean, I remember Henry Fonda, and I used to think how crazy it was. He would say, every, every, when every job ended, he thought that was his last job. He'd never work again. And I think a lot of us have this. I mean, I, I don't know how you'd ever get over it, uh, really. You actually experienced kind of a dry spell for, for a few years, didn't you? I, was that no, no. <laughs> that was real. <laughs> but you're doing fine in these Nike commercials, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Nike commercials are great, but that job's done. You can't go back to it. No, I, I stopped it. I, I was only going to do one year, and then uh, then I did a second year, and then I said no more. But I enjoyed them, and uh, it was a big decision to do that because, you know, it's so fickle, this industry. I mean, to do a commercial, boy, you're really... If you do television, it's hard for you to do features. So, um, I mean, to jump into doing a commercial is like suicidal. 
But I thought that, like, you know, hey, Spike Lee had done Nike. And, like, you know, and all my favorite, I'm such a sports junkie that, uh, you know, all my favorite sports people are on Nike. And I just said, hey, you know, I love football, and they'd never done football before. It was a lot of pluses for me. And uh, it's funny because I have a whole new audience out there that uh, recognizes me. It's funny. So if you thought that was suicidal, was there ever thought that maybe Waterworld was suicidal <laughs> after a while? No, I just came up with a new one, though, man. I fig finally figured out why I'm in the movie. If anything went wrong, they could blame it on me. <laughs> I mean, that was a good one, huh? No, well, anyway, I guess. Tell, yeah. us you your, <laughs> tell us about your role of Deacon. How did you, how did you develop that? And they, they told us that you, it was your idea to, to shave your head, etc. What else did you bring to it? Actually, I don't know where they got that idea. They probably read a different script than I read, but it was scripted that I had my head shaved. And uh, I called Kevin Reynolds and I said, uh, do I really have to, I was with, I had a razor in my hand at the time, ready to go for it. I said, do I really have to shave my head? And he said, let me call you back. And he called me back in five minutes and he said, yeah, shave your head. I said, okay, Zzz, got it off. It was, uh, it was uh, interesting shaving my head. I felt very vulnerable. I didn't feel tough at all. It was totally the opposite way. I felt like a newborn baby and you could feel all the heat and cold and, very vulnerable. Uh, how, the part itself, um, I, uh, I added a little accent, a little good old boy accent, sort of an LBJ kind of uh, accent, and uh, uh, I thought of him as something between Mussolini and uh, you take Mussolini and Hitler and uh, LBJ and uh, and uh, some evangelist, and you put him in a wearing blender, and uh, out pops the deacon. But uh, my biggest problem was um, because the character was so big and so broad to keep reminding myself not to get big because of like when you have all these stunts going on behind you and all these explosions and stuff and the canvas is so big that I thought it would be interesting if this was an everyday thing to him and it wasn't a big thing to him. It was more a throwaway. We're going to take the atoll. We'll get the atoll. It'll be okay. Not to be as big. The tendency was to be as big as what's going on behind you. So anyway, I just had to keep reminding myself that the deacon's world was, this was his world, and it was an everyday world. And I especially like the scenes. I like myself in this picture, by the way. So I especially like to see my, when I have one eye going and I can see an inner life working through one eye. I think, wow, that's really cool. So, uh, but... Um, yeah, that was my biggest concern, and just trying to make him real. I love it when he's up on the thing giving the speech to everybody, and he's turning and making his sides. It'll take him years before they figure out. take him months before they figure out I'm full of shit, you know what I mean? Uh, I really don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I, I thought those were very funny sort of uh, end things. I had a really good time on this film. I had, it was a wonderful living experience for me. I don't have any horror stories to tell. I got along with the director. I got along with the producers. I, I had a really, um, just a wonderful, wonderful time. I was only in, in the eight months that I was on the picture, I was only called in one day that I didn't work. Now, you know, I mean, when you're playing the bad guy in a movie, very often uh, you're called in because they don't know whether they're going to need you or not need you, and you sit there and sit there and sit there day after day after day. Never happened on this movie. When I was called, I was called in one day, I had to put my eye on that I didn't work, and everybody apologized and apologized for that. But how amazing that was to me. And it was really a well-organized movie. The, the movie, the money that was spent, which did go over budget, is up on the screen. I never saw anybody work hard than the people worked on this movie and uh, I just hope it all turns out well for them it's a huge gamble and not a very not a very smart gamble obviously when you're going to uh, be make, having to make over 400 million dollars to go into profits but the point is the studio backed it they didn't pull the plug on it they went along with it and the people made the movie and covered the movie and made the movie that they wanted to make and uh, I think it's admirable. You didn't sense that look. Kevin was feeling any any pressure along Kevin Costner or Kevin Reynolds or both? I saw the pressure that was being put upon Kevin Reynolds and I saw a man sit there. I never heard him ever raise his voice. I never heard him be anything but a gentleman. Uh, he gave me great input. Uh, I had a wonderful working relationship with him and I never saw him and Kevin Costner fight. I never saw an argument between the two of them. So, like, I, I don't have any, I'm, the things I read, I have no knowledge of. I mean, it's like me reading like anybody else reading and saying, really? I didn't see any of that, you know? So I, I don't know, you know? You just got this lovely gleam on your, in your eye when you said, I really liked myself in this movie. I, mm. I like yeah. myself. Yeah. 
what what other movies would you say that you felt that same sort of? I really like myself in this movie. Well, um, I really liked Speed. I really liked the movie Speed. I thought what a roller coaster ride that was, and I thought I was really good in it because I was like the guy next door. You know, I figured that guy next door is blowing everybody away. is really weird. You know, I didn't feel like he was a real monster. You know, I mean, I mean, he was a monster, but he, I wanted to play him uh, like the guy next door. This, the deacon, is not the guy next door. You know, what I mean, so uh, I just, I just enjoyed seeing myself in the film. I, I, uh, I believed myself. I bought into it. I accepted it. As outrageous as it all is, because it's like a huge comic book, isn't it? I mean, you know. A uh, huge uh, environmental uh, comic book. Jean said she avoids uh, so much as even taking a bath these days because she's so sick of the water. How do you feel about the water after all that time? I don't know, but it makes me feel differently about Jean. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I bathe a lot more personally. <laughs> Talk about all that makeup. Could you tell them about that? Uh, you know, I had the same makeup man. Fred was the same makeup man I had on Apocalypse Now. I saw a lot of old friends on this. You know, we like, we're like gypsies, I, I figure, actors. We go from one family uh, for a couple months or eight months in this instance, and then if we're lucky enough, we go to another extended family, and we're with that family, and hardly ever do we ever see these people again. But in this case, I saw people that had worked, I'd worked on Giant with I, I uh, the the sets were uh, built by the people who did Apocalypse Now. Uh, uh, Dean Simler was a cinematographer from Super Mario Brothers and from Mad Max and all those movies. But there were a lot of people here that I worked with. A lot of the stuntmen through the years that I had worked with on various pictures, um, the special effects people. It was just it was like a big family a, a reunion of sorts uh, coming back together. So it was a, it was a it was a. It was a joyous experience for me, very well, honestly. It takes a little while to put that on. Oh, the, two hours. It took about two hours every day. Where a little the, while ago. Where do the smokers get the smokes? <laughs> Prop man. I, mean, I, was thinking, I was just trying to figure out, okay, are those seaweed cigarettes? Or are they, there's a lot of cigarettes. And you're, yeah, I had herbal cigarettes, you know. I had the prop man get me special cigarettes. I don't know about the other people. Yeah, when these kind of pictures, I always go to the prop man myself. <laughs> It's the best advice I can give you. Um. A, little while ago, a little while ago, Tina Majorino said that she was so thrilled to work with you because you worked with James Dean. And after I got over the shock of the fact of a 10-year-old knowing who James Dean was, I realized that was 40 years ago. Yeah. We're, we're coming up, I guess, on the, uh, you know, it's wow. been 40 years since, since that happened. What do you think about that? What Reflect back on that. I was sitting the other day somewhere in France or somewhere where they were, uh, we were all rejoicing, having a, a celebration for the 100th year of film. And I suddenly realized that I had been in films for 41 of those hundred years. I went, wow, boy. Whew. Anyway, what was the question? Well, just, just, you know, what was, what was going on then? It was a new time, of course, for you because mm -hmm. it was new in your career, but also the things that you were doing have lasted, have, have, have become mm -hmm. part of that film iconography. Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I just feel really lucky that I, I had no great plan to a career. Uh, I just went basically from job to job, and I was very, I was very talented, and uh, um, and I love what I do. But beyond that, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, my getting into Rebel Without a Cause when I was 18 years old, and then Giant when I was 19, uh, um, then getting in a lot of trouble because I knew Jimmy, and I wanted to emulate the way he worked. I wanted to block my own scenes and so on, and do stuff that got me in a lot of trouble. And, and actually got me blackballed in the industry for a long time. So then I went to New York and I studied with Strasberg, who Dean had studied with and so on. And I came back and I finally directed Easy Rider and then I made the last movie for this studio actually and then I never, and then I couldn't direct anymore. Uh, Universal Pictures refused to distribute the movie after I'd won the Venice Film Festival. Went through that so it took me 10 years before I directed another movie again. And my career has been very strange but in the process of that I, I I realized the other day that I this is the third time I have been in the most expensive movie ever made. The first time was Giant with Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor, and James Dean, and that one cost 13 million. And then there was Apocalypse Now, which I think cost somewhere between 40 and 60. And now there's this one, which is rumored to cost somewhere between 140 and two. Uh, I, I say 170 because it seems reasonable, but I, I have no proof of that. The other day I was saying I have 500 stuntmen behind me.
I read the thing, there were 60 stuntmen. <laughs> so, hey, you know, I can exaggerate when I want to, but, uh, <clears throat> or have to. You mentioned uh, two movies that I can think of, or three movies that I can think of right now that are classics. What do you think it is that that, that has t really taken the test of time for Apocalypse Now, Easy Rider, and let's say Giant? What do I feel? How do you think? What do you think it is about those films that they really stood the test of time? And there are real classics. Well, it's got to be. It's got to be the vision of the filmmakers. I think. I mean, you know, I I don't know how you feel about this movie, but when I look at this movie, I, the first time I looked at it, I, I saw it four days before I saw it the other night. Uh, I was just looking at what was gone from my part, very honestly. But when I went the other night to look at it, I really enjoyed it. All I needed was a big box of popcorn. I went for it. But when I look at it, I look at all the coverage. You know, I mean, how, how much coverage there is and the incredible shots there that, that, that accumulate to make a scene, you know, and how brilliantly that's done. And how, I mean, that, the attack on that atoll is unbelievable. I mean, it's really amazing, and the way those, the way the guys come up out of the water and leap or go sw diving over the top of the, th you know, with their jet skis. I mean, that's incredible stuff, stuff that's never been done. I, I, uh, I look at it how unique the film is and how different it is from anything that we've seen, and how technically it's almost impossible to believe that any of it was done. And I, I'm just, uh, I'm in awe of it, and I don't know how an audience will take to it, but. But um, it's an amazing piece of work. Didn't so what's you missing from your guilty, guilty tormenting poor little uh, Tina? Oh, what, do Didn't I? Did you feel a little guilty tormenting poor Tina? I mean. Yeah, yeah, I did. They cut out my they cut out my proposing to her though. You know, when I finally said, when everything's not working, on, on the, the whole ship is blowing up, I finally said, okay, it's just you, you and me in a bungalow in paradise, all right? And I'm going to want lots of kids. And I throw over my shoulder <laughs> and go off with her. And then when I get, when I got on the plane, when I got on the plane, she bites me and I say, hey, if you don't stop biting me, I'm going to think twice about marrying you. <laughs> But anyway, I guess that was a little too over the top. But <laughs> uh, she is an amazing kid. Yeah, she's she's incredible. You know, you know what's amazing is uh, uh, so many young young kids are thrown in by their parents into something, and they really don't care about acting, and uh, they're doing it for their parents or whatever. She really cares about acting. She's a dedicated actress at 10 years old, and I heard her say something the other day. She said. Uh, she said, oh, I don't know about being a leading lady, but she said, I want to be, I want to be a great actress. I thought, wow, man, you know, how amazing that is to be able to be that focused, to care that much, to want it now. And, uh, and she is, and she really has an uncanny sense of things, how she doesn't want it, she wants to underplay everything, she doesn't want to go over the top, and... Uh, Did she ever give you any... Uh no, but I'll tell you something. When you're acting with her, you better watch. You better watch what you're doing, because she's really uh, she plays. Uh, she plays in an area that you come to her, rather than her coming to you. And uh, you have to be sensitive enough to know what level she's playing on, because she plays very, very subtle and very minimal stuff, and very, very good and very honest. And uh, if you're sort of into your own thing and don't pick up on it. She's liable to blow you right out of the box. You know? Dennis, could you talk about um, speaking at the Actors Studio recently, and what was that experience like for you? Well, the Actors Studio for years was an in, it's been an independent nonprofit organization, but uh, uh, it's gotten very expensive, and it's not been able to carry its own weight. So Paul Newman, for years, has been financing the Actors Studio, and it's been costing him somewhere between a million and a million and a half dollars every year. He calls it his salad money, because he it's off his salad dressing and stuff. But but uh, it, it's a little boring to have to come up with that kind of money every year for something. And and finally, the actor studio. I'm on the board of directors of the studio. Finally, we got together and figured out a way that that this Bravo channel, by doing these things, we could actually pay for the studio without Paul. 
I mean, without, not without Paul, but without Paul having to dish it out every year. And uh, so the series uh, is uh, something that's funding the, funding the actor studio. And also, it's the first school where you can actually go now with the new school involved, where the g people who graduate from the actor studio and graduate from the new school will actually have degrees, and they will be able to teach in the universities that teach teach Strasbourg and teach uh, uh, method acting. So it's a it's a really wonderful thing that's happening and uh, that's what it was about and it was a great it was a real thrill first of all to be asked and um, and uh, the man who who who, uh, who did the interview with me was so well informed that it was just amazing. He kept blowing me out of the box by the information that he had. I kept saying, how, how could you know that? And he said, we're a research school. Da -da -da -da. I said, boy, you sure are. But uh, it was an amazing evening, and, and uh, it's something that it really meant a lot to me because I, I really would like to, uh, hopefully, not this year, not 10 years, but I would like to end the, last, the latter part of my life uh, teaching. I really would like to do that. So. Will there be another series after this one that they're doing now? <clears throat> oh yeah, they, it will continue. Yeah. Yeah. Are you Are going you? to direct something? Well, tell us about some of your future projects. Well, right at the moment, everything I want to direct is too dark. That's the new word, too dark. So I'm looking for lighter covers, you know. Oh, come on. But no. I, uh, I'll, I'll direct something next year. I'm not quite sure what. Um, no, no, I'll do a film. I won't do television. Will there be a space trucker? Is there gonna be, are you going to ever sit down and finish that? I doubt it. Why? I, uh, I don't know. First of all, I'm not, I don't think that I'm capable at this, at this point in my life to be, to be able to go public with a lot of stuff that, uh, that I mean, I, I don't think I, I can be honest enough about my life. I think it would hurt too many other people. And um, uh, I was involved in things that were not necessarily um, good uh, legal things to be involved in, you know, during my drug days. And I, I just, uh, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to do something until I can be really honest about it and really talk about it. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I don't think I'm there. Well, you know, there a, yeah. Did you have a sense of um, what it was about you that enabled you to act as you do when you were younger? Did you do something and people came flocking to you saying, you really have some talent, or did you feel it within what caused you to pursue then the career from there? Well, like, I uh, I wanted to be an actor from the time I was very young. I was raised in Kansas on a wheat farm, and uh, first time I went to the movies, I wanted to know where they were made and how they were made. And uh, But I, I don't think that's any different than most kids, probably. Uh, but... Uh, I didn't see a way out of where I was. I mean, I saw, you know, I, uh, uh, I guess sports or uh, acting or, you know, um, I guess if I'd been in Spain, I'd probably try to be a matador or Italy, I'd probably try to be a race car driver. I just happened to be in America and like sports and acting looked like the only way out of where I was. You Are know? you good at sports? Yeah, yeah. What's your I, I love football. I was a little too small to play professional football. <laughs> But uh, yeah. Anyway, I I, uh, I went when I moved from Kansas uh, when I was 13 to San Diego. I started working at the Old Globe Theater. I wanted to be an actor really young. Uh, so um, I started, and by the time I was 18, I went under contract at Warner Brothers. I was uh, good. Are you a thrill seeker at all? I know Kevin Costner did so much of his own stunts. Um, do you do you pursue doing your own stunts and uh, not only in movies but outside of movies? Do you enjoy? Pushing it to the limit? Well, when I was younger, you know, I used to race cars and I used to do all that, and I caped a few bulls and did that stuff. You know, I'm I'm 59 years old. I I'm not so much. Uh, I'm looking for. Uh, you know, I I want to go to the gym an hour a day and then like sit in front of the TV. Yeah. That's <laughs> thrilling up. <for> <laughs> and missing those three foot putts just kill me. I don't know how long I can do that. The, 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 range, of roles, the range of roles that you go after are fascinating. I mean, you've got Basquiat coming up, which is a very serious uh, dramatic film. Yeah. Something called Space Truckers. Oh, yeah, but I've got one coming out called Acts of Love that Bruno Barreto directed, that Amy Irving and I are in, and uh, and Gary Busey and Hal Holbrook and... and uh, uh, Julie Harris plays my mother that was in uh, East of Eden with James Dean. And it's a wonderful Jim Harrison novel. Jim Harrison novel called Farmer, which they're calling Acts of Love. But I play a school teacher, uh, 
farmer, cripple. Um, that's really amazing. I mean, I, it's a very d d big departure for me. And space truckers, what is that? Space truckers, I'm playing an independent trucker in space who who won't refuse to join the union, and uh, the only job he can get is uh, flying genetically squared pigs, because they're easy to stack, and it's a shitty job, but somebody's got to do it, you know what I mean? And, Thank uh, you. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> I guess that ended that. <laughs> when you were in Paris, did you see the, uh, that, the medal that they made for James Dean? No. They, no. You know, for the hundred. Oh, did they really? I was over there, and at the Mint, they have a special medal that they oh. made. This, you know, wow. Oh, yeah. that's great. That sounds really cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Could you sign that one there? MJI. Yeah, that one. Appreciate it. MJI. Is there a particular memory of James? Yeah, Cameron thought that you have when his name comes up so often. Did you take a little break, or could you just talk to him? I had a little trouble reading. Do I? I'm sorry. Do I what? Is there a particular memory you have of James Dean that obviously was a great influence on your career? Yeah. We have our own rules. It's just, I just remembering as being the best actor I ever saw work. You know, I never saw anybody as imaginative or as creative as he was, and uh, he was really amazing. And he was also, he was also very eccentric and very, um, had more magnetism, was more interesting than anybody I ever met. And that's just uh, strange to say, but it's true. So when people, when people start saying, well, this person or that person or this person or that person, they're dull. Dean was not dull. And people either loved him or hated him. They didn't say he was okay or right. They either loved him or hated him. And he was a very different, very unique person. Okay. Very any strange the, uh, guy. Any of the recent bios hit the, hit the mark? First of all, all the people that do his bios are seem to be homosexual. They all seem to be saying that he's a homosexual. Dean was not a homosexual. I mean, you know, if he'd been a homosexual, he'd been practicing in the streets, he wouldn't have been in the closet. He had a lot of friends who were homosexual, but all of us in this business do. And uh, the guy that was his biographer, his first biographer, uh, was at UCLA with him, it was gay. And so, you know, uh, he's... Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that they've taken that tact on him because that's not uh, not the guy I knew. I mean, the guy I knew was like uh, w wanted to marry, uh, uh, tried to marry um, Anna Marie uh, uh, Albergetti. Albergetti, and then was in love with uh, Ursula Andres, and both of them married somebody else. But um, I don't know. I find that unfortunate. So like, they're not really very clear to me. So we've got those biopics coming up. I guess there are two of them being worked on. I think Leonardo DiCaprio is the only young actor possibly that could possibly ever play James Dean because I think he's just great. And he said he doesn't want to do it because he couldn't live up to the performances of Dean. Did he? Well, then, then he's uh, real... He's, Thank he's you, smart. everybody. <laughs> all right, so that was Dennis Hopper. Now, all that stuff at the very end about James Dean, we only got because I was in the habit of not hitting stop on my tape recorder until the talent walked out of the room. You can hear all of the clicks about two minutes earlier when everyone else shut off their own tape recorders after he said thank you and the formal part of the interview was clearly over. But I kept recording like I always did. Because if they were still sitting there at the table, you know, maybe signing autographs or making small talk, whatever, you, you never know. They might say something interesting and worth keeping. And this was one of those times. I'm probably the only journalist at that table who walked away with those sound bites. Yep. I, I couldn't use them at the time because other people in the room were also talking, so the sound isn't clean. But we can include it now. Good you know. job, sir. That was a very good job. I, I was listening to the interview, and I go, well, I, I don't remember him talking about Dean like this. Well, that's because it wasn't on your tape, but it was on mine. Yes. You know, like I always used to say back then, tape is cheap. So, you know, why not keep recording as long as they're still there? Right. You never know. They might say something cool. Now, Dennis Hopper said that he was looking to direct something the following year, but it looks like he didn't find anything. He actually never directed another film after that. His final directed film, Chasers, had already come out the year before. But he did direct a couple of short films in 2000 and 2008. It was interesting to hear him say that he was looking to do a film, and he said, I will not do television. 
nowadays that stigma is gone and film actors do TV all the time. But you have to remember that back in 1995, that was still taboo and it was considered to be a career ender. So that was a little dated moment there. He said that he would like to spend the latter part of his life teaching. I scoured the internet trying to find out whether he did and I couldn't find anything, which probably means that he didn't. He also said that he wasn't ready yet to write his autobiography. He never did. The only books he ever published were of his photographs from the 1960s. Mm. And that's what I have for Dennis Hopper. Greg, you got anything? Yeah, I have one thing. He, Go for it. He talks about this movie with Bruno Barreto. I believe he called it Acts of Love. This is during the interview. It ended up being called Carried Away. and actually, Or maybe it was called Farmer. But it's based, Carried Away is directed by Bruno Barreto. He mentions in the, in, in the interview, it's based on a novel called Farmer, written by Jim Harrison. And I actually did the Carried Away junket. I don't have the tape back in 96. I don't remember you being there, Matt. So I hope that that tape isn't lost. But mm. if listeners, if you have not seen, if you're looking for a great Dennis Hopper performance, I think from what I've seen, it, this is my favorite performance from Dennis Hopper. It's a very subdued, emotional performance. It's called Carried Away. So that's going back to the interview that he uh, talks about. So Carried Away was released a year later after Waterworld in 1996. Also, as you know, his Basquiat, which was mentioned in the interview, was also released sure. that same year. Also critically acclaimed, more acclaimed than Carried Away, but Carried Away is a forgotten, in my opinion, forgotten, uh, really masterpiece of a performance, masterful performance from Dennis Hopper. Yeah. All right. So I guess we're ready to move on now to the main event. The main event? Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner. Who played the Mariner. It's a fairly lengthy interview. We got him for 27 and a half minutes. Greg, anything you want to say about his bio? I mean, I, I think they, they, everyone kind of knows, knows who he is, right? Everyone knows who, who he is. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good interview. The, the thing about, we're talking about damage control regarding Waterworld or whenever we've had Costner in, at Press Junkets, he's always He's, he's been, always doing damage control. <laughs> no, he's always been a straight shooter. So you're going yeah. he, to hear a lot of straight shooter talk from Kevin Costner, especially regarding his, uh, like Matt, Matt alluded to in the beginning, his relationship with his working relationship with Kevin Reynolds. So, Right, who left halfway through filming. Right. Um, we're going to get into Kevin Costner. You have a couple things that you want to say before? Yeah, yeah. Uh, history alert. Coming up, Costner is going to tell you how much a movie ticket cost in 1995. So look out for that and get ready to feel old. Also, brace yourself, kids, for it's time once again for the Beatles question. I was kidding before. We actually love the Beatles question. It's our favorite. I loved it. Now, in his answer, Kevin Costner describes going to school, and I quote, someplace between Santa Paula and Ojai. The name of the town that he's deliberately not naming is Ventura. We are recording this podcast in Ventura right now. The school that he went to was Buena High School, which he attended about 10 years before I did. It's just down the street. Greg, you passed it on your way up. I had no idea. Zachary Levi went there too, by the way. Whoa, okay. We are not a generic city between Santa Paula and Ojai. We have a name. It's Ventura, California. Thanks. So yeah, that, I had no idea. I'm really blown away. I hope you yeah, guys... Yeah, he, he was... When I went to high school, he was the celebrity who had attended the high school and everyone knew it. And I remember being in my journalist class and we pulled out old yearbooks and we, we saw him, you know, in high school with his kind of frizzy hair and... That's cool. Everyone was very excited about the fact that Kevin Costner had gone to our high school. So, Buena High School in Ventura, California. We are not a generic city. And, and Kevin Costner is not a generic filmmaker or actor. So, no. let's listen to Kevin Costner. Ventura raised, for Pete's sake. But you ask what you need to ask. Funny you, you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something out of left field that I have to get out of the way now rather than interrupt the flow once we get going. I haven't, any so, I haven't had any coffee or anything, so I'll do the best I can right here. I appreciate that. Okay. We're doing a show on the Beatles reunion. Oh, thank you. And, uh, I feel like I'm up to a heart thing. I'm sorry. But. <laughs> Right. Why the voltage now? Yeah. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Breathe easily. Once you sit down, Kevin, the, the question is, where were you when you first heard the Beatles, and what did you think? I was, um, <laughs> I, I think I was seven years old, uh, and I was in a, I was going to a little one-room schoolhouse at the time up between Santa Paula and Ojai. I lived up in the mountains, and uh, 
and uh, I remember it was funny I remember two events I remember hearing them and I think that night uh, listening to the Sonny Liston uh, Cassius Clay fight some guy had a I mean it was like got jolted with two pretty uh, dominant people of the of the uh, century but I, for some reason I, I tie those two people together Can't, there's no real correlation between them but that was my recollection of them and what did you think when you first heard that? The, uh, I, I, I liked it, you know, and uh, I always thought the songs were short and quick. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I Kevin, thought, well, I could do that. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin it's, it's, finally, it's finally on the screen, but looking back, if you'd known what it was going to take to get it up July 28th, would you have, would you have done, gone through it? No, I would not have. I th the, there was, it's been a, a difficult... Uh, it was a difficult movie. Uh, I don't like dealing with intrigue and with pain, and, and uh, it wasn't all pain. I want to be really clear about that because I made some very, very good friends and uh, made a good movie with people who are really good at what they do. One of the great action movies that kind of uh, challenged the genre a little bit, in my opinion. Uh, it's what I wanted to do. Um, but I believe in environment. And when environment's not good, a lot of times there's nothing you can do about it. You have to keep going forward. But I would prefer to be in an environment where I, I feel good and that uh, even though you know a movie's going to be hard, everybody's working towards it. We had a lot of that. There was a lot of camaraderie that existed on that movie. And, and to, to think that there wasn't would just be a complete untruth. How do you feel about the trial by media that's been going on as well? Well, no one would like to go through what I've gone through. I, uh, if I imagine you all have children, wives, sweethearts. You're all human beings. Uh, so I don't think you, you would enjoy that. So I think uh, without trying to feel sorry for myself, I can just uh, throw myself at, in terms of uh, you might imagine how I might feel. No, it's not just that. It's the fact that how people have been about the movie that everyone seems to be trying to kill it. Oh, oh, you all right? Yeah. It's too bad that that, ha that happened um, because uh, in my life, I feel like uh, I don't like people telling me what to think in the first place about things. Uh, entertainment, when the curtain opens, is supposed to be a really magical moment where no matter what happens, it all goes away. It's almost like a sporting event. Once the speculation dies down, it's really up to the players. And, and uh, I have a relationship with movie audiences that I, I don't make the same type of movie. I have different genres that I've entered into. And so the surprise of what I might do and what I would be thinking about this past year in my life, I would like to be a surprise for people who pay their $7 who go. Um, the speculation about it, you know, I think that, you know, we don't get enough good information and the volume of information that's gone out has been, has been not good, not consistent, and not fair. That's too bad for movies, but I think it's a sign of our times and I won't be able to change it probably in my lifetime. But the thing that I do know how to do is work on movies and uh, throughout whatever you thought I might have experienced, the, the thing I realized I had to do was keep my eye on the ball, which was the movie. Does it almost make you want to give up and go off and hide somewhere? <laughs> Look, if I tell you that I'm just like you, then you might understand that, that a person could have those feelings. You know, um, no one likes to be embarrassed. No one likes to be lied about. Everyone would like to live their life and make the mistakes that come with a life. And that's the way I am. You had to Martin. become very agile, agile on your on your boat, so to speak. Yeah. It was much more than that. Um, how much of that was you having to learn physical skills to do that, and how much was stamina? Well, I that that's probably one of the, um, the 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 blessings that I have as an actor is I'm physical. So um, the production could lean on me a lot in terms of not having to use doubles in most instances, which saved us. Even though it was a long movie, we probably could have tacked on another 20 days if I didn't do my own stunts because you would basically have to change the camera angles to, to hide who's ever doing the stunt. And uh, so in a sense, sometimes I made decisions against my better judgment to do things just so that we could get through the day. Because there were comments about what was, uh, what uh, took the budget up as opposed to, so are you saying that by you doing your stunts you were, you decreased the number of days of shooting? I absolutely, I'm, I'm a pretty fiscally oriented person. I mean, I've made movies, okay, I've financed movies with my own money. Uh, so the notion of throwing around money, I don't want to get into where, where it goes. That's not a M.O. for me, okay? So I've had to wear that 
that yoke too of where the where the money went. But uh, decisions that that um, that I can make are always fiscally oriented and story oriented. So you know I'll butt heads with a studio over a story idea, no matter what it costs, and then I'll go back to production and try to figure out look, we got to you know find a different way to skin this cat. Hey, Kevin. What is the scariest moment? We'll come back. No, that's okay. What was the scariest moment that you had physically or mentally or emotionally? You know, I had a I had a lot uh, in this movie more than than um, than and it wasn't because of anybody. It just was the nature of the movie. You saw what was going on out there. Uh, you saw the movie, and um, there was a lot of times. There was probably ten, ten plus times where um, if a mistake occurred, um, it was probably meant um, the end of my career, the end of my life. And I'm not, I'm not being too overdramatic. I've talked to most of you over the years. This particular movie, I found myself in positions that if, if something didn't work, sometimes I was just a passenger, so it, didn't, it wasn't a matter of my own sheer strength to hold myself up 80 feet. I was a passenger flying through fire and way up high above. But if something went wrong, it was, it was, the outcome was bleak. Top in of terms the mask, of physical challenges, how does this compare to some of your other movies, and could you be specific? Well, physical challenges is probably right. It's at the top. It, you, you're talking about number of days on a movie. Um, you know, there, there are scenes where I'm wet, and then, then basically what you realize is I'm wet all day. I mean, I'm wet all day. I mean, I have really good friends I work with, and the next thing you know, they're throwing buckets of water on me, and pretty soon I got to hating them, too. But I you mean, know. in terms of movies like Dances Like Wolves and other movies that you've done, yeah. um, how much of this does, the comparison of how much this takes out of you versus other movies where you have a greater emotional investment? Right. It took a lot out of me because emotionally, um, I got dragged into it both from a personal level. I had to deal with a personal life, and I had to deal uh, with... Um, trying to be, you know, a, a, a middleman for uh, my director and the studio, trying to protect him, trying to protect the movie. And uh, in the end, the director didn't finish the movie, and so it logically fell to me. I knew, I knew how that was going to read. I mean, you don't have to be a, a genius to know what somebody who takes an outside look at it uh, was going to say about that so it, it's uh it's been over a year well over a year on a movie and you know I can if I was just acting in a movie I could have done two movies or perhaps three movies in the same year but as it is uh, the year it's well past a year um, I worked on this movie and you it was a long time Kevin is there like a certain way to actually balance all these elements together is there like a, sort of a quick fix formula for it? There's not. You know, you have to get up in the morning. There's 24 hours in a day. Uh, the problem I had today, I'm going to have tomorrow. If it's an emotional problem, a personal problem, or a production problem, and you just you 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 deal with all three, and um, you know it's it's life. You know, I'm uh, I'm sure you've all dealt with pain in your life. You know, tragedy. Uh, you know, failure, success, and and uh, you can't get you, when you have to do a job. It doesn't really. You have to just get up in the morning and go do it, and you have to be as clear-headed about what you're doing, as uh, as reasonable, compassionate, and as resourceful as you can be. And you know, sometimes you know you go to work and you fake it. You know, you just do the very best you can, and your heart's on the ground. Were you faking it, too, Kevin? At times, I mean, the, at times when you thought you just wouldn't get through. The, uh, well, I was faking my chin being stuck out there like this, you know. Um, uh, um, but, you know, I, w I always was able, I was clear-headed always about what we were doing. I couldn't afford to not be because of, because of the physicality of the role. I couldn't be caught daydreaming. And the other notion was because we were working so heavily w inside the elements that uh, you really had to be ready to go at a moment's notice. You know, it wasn't a kind of thing of where am I going to get my motivation. You go, look, you know, the seas have died down. Let's go. Or the seas are really rough. They're going to get rougher. Let's go, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, do you want one take at this? You know, you've been wanting to do a scene, you know, for a year, whole scene to do a year. Now you got like, you know, two minutes to do the scene that you really like to do well. What might you say was the turning point at which things went badly when it started going towards the high budget and the problems? Uh, right at the very beginning, and that was just not a, that was simply not an acknowledgement uh, on the studio's part that the movie was going to be over 100 million to start. You know that um, I can understand someone want not in, wanting to not green light a movie that was over 100 million dollars, but we know there's been 10, 15 movies made 
in the $130 million range. This movie should have, was budgeted, should have been budgeted at that number, but uh, from a studio standpoint, I think they were embarrassed to say to the community, we have just green-lighted a movie that's budgeted at $130 million. These other movies we're talking about, they were going to be that expensive too. But no one wanted to say that particular number. So what happens just in terms of trying to save face, you start a movie that's scheduled to be under 100 days and under $100 million, when in fact probably it should have been scheduled at 120 days and, and budgeted $130 million. Then what you would have not had happen on the first day was you would have not been behind schedule and you would not have been over budget. And then the number uh, that you ended up at from a budget standpoint probably would have fallen absolutely in line with all normal budgets of movies where they go over. Then you would have been 20% over. And the reason you'd have been 20% over because the, the, um, the, the variable of working on the water. So I have a practical approach to movies, but people sometimes in this business have a saving face about movies. I mean, I say what I'm going to do when I'm going to make a movie. People knew Dances was going to be three hours long. Okay, I wasn't going to make it with anybody. I knew there was going to be subtitles. So there's no games when I make a movie. But uh, I think I think when um, there's this much money at stake, people play games. But unfortunately, what happened is that siphoned back to myself and the director, and I was playing protection for him and catch up for them from the very first day. Being a very committed father. How you now, you talked about the Look, I'll, I'll, I'll drift right down to you. Let me, I think she was on attack, and then I'll slide Being right down. Very committed no father, what is it like? <laughs> on attack. Yeah, yeah, get this boat turned around. <laughs> what is it like when you have How am I doing? Are you doing all right? <laughs> you have a question? Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you'll be, you'll be piping in here, baby. How, how is it when you have to have such testy scenes with a young person? Well, that can be rough. I've, I've worked with uh, children before, uh, F Field of Dreams, uh, Perfect World, uh, uh, The War, <laughs> the, uh, and of course this movie. And uh, Tina is, uh, is uh, just, Tina was really as good as they come is really as good as they come and, and understood what she was doing and, and uh, she trusted me. In fact, she did some incredible stunts and she did them with me. People don't know, she flew from that back of the boat and her mother let her do that. And uh, it's funny, you know, when someone puts that much trust in you, how much higher your survival instincts for her go up and stuff. And so there was a really great relationship. I mean, she was in my arms swinging 40, 50 feet over an open ocean into wires and all kinds of stuff, and she was right in my arms. You talked about the physicality of the role, and uh, Mariner is a presence, but really doesn't have that much dialogue. How do you get into a character like that? What, what's the challenge? Well, then, then there's, then it's every one of his moves physically becomes a, a, a word to me. Um, you know, he. Uh, um, you know, his boat took on a Swiss Family Robinson um, uh, kind of feel that what he could just touch something. So you knew he was a very resourceful guy. Um, uh, people like that that we know have very waste, little wasted motion. You know, they they, they move where they want to go. He uh, um, it, it, he is a traditional American uh, centerpiece, film centerpiece. He's the enigmatic uh, loner where you don't know where he comes from, you don't know what his background is. American cinema is, is founded on those type of characters, and he's, he's absolutely one, so I, I enjoyed that. I just wanted to make him not get swallowed up with the uh, funniness that the other characters could have. You know, um, he, he, we needed to have a character that when he said something, you believed it. And, and uh, one of the things I love most about the film is maybe some of the most unflattering moments, which is he is very hard on the women. But I think that out of that comes humor and not the one-line quip. When you say stay away from him, what happens is even as an audience goes through the movie, you go, yeah, stay away from him. He, you know, it's, it's not the one time he does something and then he turns soft. It's like he is who he is. And I think that that's where uh, uh, movies succeed is in their consistency. And uh, so he is not a... It's not flattering how he deals, but I think it's absolutely consistent with who that character is. This is his boat. This is what he what he does. And and uh, there are some people that didn't want me to be as hard on them, but I think in the end, it's tough love and it's earned. Is that why Kevin, the whole scene was such a fight with the studio? 
It wasn't much of a fight. No. I mean, they kept bringing it up. But I wasn't going to change that. I just simply could not change that to make, who, you know, who, who would I have been pleasing, really? Uh, what, what you're trying to take out is a fear factor. And there should be no fear where this movie's concerned. You know, you're adults. You've seen had enough life experience. I mean, y you don't believe in being abusive to children, both men and women. But we're dealing with a movie that that had survival instincts at that was at the heart of of this movie for me and so I would be more afraid to, to soften those moments I'm terrified I mean I actually did for them I recut it took it out you know the little the sail falls down on her and, and it's like there's the music ah, 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 ah. you know there's the joke and uh, now I, I walk up the thing but I wanted to set in fire and steel that this is my boat and that when you hold a gun on me, you you pay an awful price. You don't do that again. Uh, of all the men you've played, of uh, the male characters that you've played in your career, which one is the closest to you? I mean, which one do, do you still enjoy looking back? I would say there's about three. Um, I would say uh, Gardner Barnes and Fandango. I would say uh, Crash Davis in um, uh, Bull Durham. And I'd say probably Wyatt Earp. And the, the ones that you could would feel comfortable putting that skin back on again, or that you... I th I'd say Wyatt, um, Wyatt Earp. Why is that? I just think that um, you know, he, he had a man's life, a whole, he had a really full life. He was uh, young and full of juice and really open. He had lines like, I like it out here, nothing much has been touched. He had young love mm -hmm. and had it taken away. Um, he, he saw the world really clearly. As a as a as a as a place, I don't know. I just can't tell you. You know, he had a, a lifelong love. You know, and a second. You know, you ask me, I can't explain it, but I know who I uh, the the adventure that he sought out. That, you know, he. Do you get personally disappointed when a film doesn't do well for you? Not not. I'm not. I get personally disappointed when a film is dismissed because I'm not dismissive of my work. My work is not to be dismissed. Uh, it's not meant to be your favorite film because there can only be one film in your life that occupies that place. But what it can do is it can fill, fill that story obligation. And uh, so um, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed when someone else makes a movie in trying to jump my movie, whether it be Robin Hood, whether it be Wyatt Earp, uh, and then and in some way impacts the feeling that the originality that that movie can have. So. Um, you have to understand, I am like you. I do get disappointed if things, you know, are not received well. But I'm more disappointed if a film doesn't end up being what it tried to be. And uh, that's not just talk. That's just that's just real for me. Well, we, can we talk to you about Wyatt Earp? I think you quoted a line about a guy saying, you know, you know, that he, he would shoot you over nothing. Uh, and I think you were referring to the press. After what you've been through since then, are you more cynical? Do you feel more of a target? Do you feel people, in a sense, are out to get you? I have a lot of friends. Uh, I, I feel like I have some friends at this table. So you know that you have to you have to watch out for generalizations because it's easy to lump people into a group, and the minute you do that, you're 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 right on the verge of being a bigot. And I'm not going to go through life like that. If I feel like that I'm experiencing too much pain, what I'll simply do is just change my life. I'll just change my career pattern, and I'll do. I'll just do something else. But I won't allow uh, people, and I won't allow my business to turn me cynical because I've been, I've had a blessed life, and I enjoy it too much to uh, keep spiraling down on some level. I uh, uh, I don't understand some things, but that's uh, life. I think probably a lot of people at this table don't understand how life works all the time. Well, Kevin, now that you finish this project, what's next for you? I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to do a, 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 a kind of a, a romantic comedy with uh, Ron Shelton, a fellow I did Bull Durham with, and uh, it's um, a set against the world of golf. And uh, right now it's called Tin Cup. Um, I play a real rascal, and uh, and um, it, it was written for me. <laughs> well, after this, I want to marry Kevin. Water. Is that, uh, it looks, sounds like you're getting two-thirds of the Dances with Wolves team back together again. Well, that's my partner, Jim Wilson. Um, and uh, we like to work with the same people, if, if you haven't noticed. We bring, them, we bring them all back because people who are good to me, um, I like to keep them close. 
um, the um, and my partner who has produced is one of the great producers in this industry uh, has a chance to direct and he um, he went out and just really muscled this picture from the ground and is making a little kind of a black comedy in um, in Maine has this experience made you think even more that any films you do maybe after Tin Cup you want to have total control on that you want to direct you want to produce it's or not, just want to be an actor for it's not it's you know control is not is not something if you start if you go through life and you have total control everything in your life is going to look and smell the same at a certain point i'm not that interested in it you know i think you're you're talking about issues with with director you have to understand something that no one has which is this problem that you perceive on that set didn't exist between just me and the director I, this is somebody that I have supported his entire career, and people had issues with what was going on there. And at a certain point, I'm the one as a producer that has to say, you're not recognizing these issues that, that are scaring people, that have a lot of, that we have a lot at stake, and someone has to step in. Now, what's happened is, the minute I do that, if someone cries foul, you know, it's not foul because that's what a job of, of a producer has been. But what you have is this turmoil that's generated over every movie that's made in this town. Every studio that puts up millions of dollars has something to say about their film. And if that is not being listened to, that is, that is number one, not a collaborative process and not what's been agreed on. And if you don't have final cut, which is what people negotiate for, then you are forced into a collaborative situation. If at that point you don't collaborate, that's almost a passive aggressive thing and this is a, was a friend of mine and I eventually had to step in and say we have got to go forward so in connection with your your question about control control is um, what you I'm able I know how to make films and so when you say control you're, you're realizing that when someone steps away it naturally falls to me and it looks like I've taken over control I think you control your own destiny in a sense. well I have control over my own destiny and I believe that I will do better if I put myself in other creative hands like the Larry Kazans of the world and and Ron Shelton so I, I will make better films when I work with people who are in control and who want at that particular time making a movie is a tremendous responsibility and um, I'm really comfortable. My control exists when I say yes to a film and, and that based on a good script. And Kevin, you said Kevin, you said wider on um, Let a Full Life. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like you're actually with film and being a father? leading quite a full life. I think I've, yeah, um, I've, I've uh, met great people in my life. Uh, there's a lot of doors that have been closed to me because of fame and celebrity, but you have to understand an equal amount of doors open as a result of that. Uh, if you talk about would you trade things, you know, for anonymity, would you go back? The answer is an absolute yes. You have something very precious in your lives when you can um, experience life and not fall under the scrutiny of, of, of what, you know, other people might want to say. So you have very blessed lives, I would, t I would tell you. Can I ask you one thing? Sure. As far as your, your, your dad or someone, is there some bit of advice someone once gave you that's been able to keep you on center and balanced because you've had a lot to face? I can't, I can't uh, take, I can't find one word of encouragement. I mean, I've had thousands, but, you know, um, uh, the, the, um, what I have in my life is I have a lot of love and I've had a lot of moral support from people who are close to me and people who don't even have a direct relationship with me that somehow catch my eyes and say keep going you know blah 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 you know so I um, you know I I've, I've, I've maybe I didn't answer that very well I just um, meant there was sometimes someone gives you a little Maybe it's your dad that in growing up that they tell you a little something that runs like a golden thread through your life. I mean, just... Well, my dad always told me to put the correct title on what it was I was doing and I wouldn't get in too much trouble. And what he meant simply by that was if you stole a piece of candy, Kev, you had to realize that you stole it. Not say you borrowed it. You stole it. And... Um, so in the way I conduct my career, if, if, uh, if I step in, if you want to make an application on Waterworld, if I put the correct title on what I did, I'm very much at peace with how I behave with everybody that I work with, and uh, both friend and, and foe. I believe in fair play, uh, and you play oftentimes with people who don't believe that way. And what you have in this world is you have, uh, you have mouthpieces that, that you have uh, venues that that if you're, there are ways for people to attack you that are willing to through the press. 
Great. Thank well, you very much. much. What, what, what was Lily's question? Well, yeah, Lily, what did you have on your mind? Yeah. Yeah, we want to know, Lily. What's that? What's that? Speak up. They want to hear. They want to. They want to hear. Can you tell them? No, I can't hardly hear it. Just, just tell them. They're, they're our friends. How did you become a movie star? How did you become a movie star? Why? Uh, uh, no, she was said how. Oh, how? And Lily, why? you gave me the hardest question. <laughs> I, know, I know. I know it. You know? Okay. You told me once. Uh, you, you had a little part in a movie, and then you were so cooperative. That they, they gave you another part in the movie. Because they cut me out, they felt so bad for me, huh? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was, I got chilled in that one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Lily, you, can Lily. you stay with us through the rest of the yeah. movie? Yeah. 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 You got good questions, though. <laughs> I feel like I boogered up some of these questions. Sorry, you guys. It, you know what? I'm sorry, we don't have time. Just to MJI. It cut in MJI Broadcasting. For, uh, Pardon me? We really I mean, don't Just to MJI time. Broadcasting. Sorry. Thanks for helping me recover from my touching. Oh, no problem. Mike, hey, that was a killer Mike movie. Mike in perfect How close are you, oh. Kevin, to being you finished know what? with it? Because he said it wasn't Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> what's that? I won't do it. Um, we won't saw a print on Friday. It looked killer. I mean, what's left? Kevin, I'm well, sorry. OK, I know. I'm, I'm just, what's, what's left What's left is, is um, really good professionals say, do I have two days? I go, yeah, you got two days. I can make this better for you, Kevin. So that really, really, what that that that's what that is. It's like okay. good good friends who got control of a couple of situations that are left. Oh, oh, saying how much time do we have? I said, I said we got to wrap this thing up by the 19th. They go, can I can I do something? And you go, yeah. That's that's the kind of people that have worked on this movie. Thanks. Just three more questions. No, no, no. Man, that ending really brought back memories. Publicists trying so hard to get the talent out of the room, but we won't stop asking questions, and they don't want to leave. So it was like a verbal tug of war. <laughs> that happened a lot. I mean, you, you probably remember that too, Greg, right? I mean, of course. Sometimes the publicist would get really angry, like, come on, we're done. We need to move to the next room. And we would just keep asking questions and they would keep answering them. And it, it got ugly. Didn't make us any friends in the publicist world. No, it didn't. But we got more stuff. So that's really what matters. I remember during the time of the interview that I, I really loved his, one of his answers going back to the interview is, how if he could play one character again and he was talking about Wyatt Earp that comment stuck with me because so many there were so many fans of Tombstone and I was actually though I do like Tombstone I was a huge fan of Wyatt Earp and I even knew back in the day when it was released by Warner Brothers that Warner Brothers didn't really give that movie a, a proper push or maybe it's because Tombstone was so popular but I ended up really liking his performance and loving the film a wider uh, but not many people are i'm in the minority here so it was a pleasure to hear him talk about praise uh wide herb well you are a minority greg but i don't know what that has to do with anything <laughs> and also him praising i guess is his his work in fandango which is a callback to his early early kevin costner and his early right. days of friendship with kevin reynolds and that that relationship with kevin reynolds continues to this day i mean kevin reynolds directed the hatfields and mccoys that that miniseries yeah yeah they they keep fighting and going their separate ways and then making up and doing another movie together and fighting again it's all fine and, and costner continues to work i mean he was uh, he's on the on that uh, tv series yellowstone which got received great reviews he was good he was good in hidden figures and molly's game was the lead in Criminal. He, you know, so he played Jonathan Kent Jonathan in the Kent. 2013 Superman film Man of Steel. Yeah, but the only thing is, you know, it would be nice to see Kevin Costner behind behind the camera once again. I would I would love to see him direct again. Uh, yeah, I know. think I think the Postman kind of put a nail into that coffin. Yeah, I mean, 2003. Look, it did not. 2003, he released Open Range. Right, and that's. That's a great Western. But again, to your point, it's been 15, 15 16 years since then. So uh, we don't know if he'll, ever, if he'll ever direct again, but at least he's, he's back on the, he continues to work on the silver screen and now recently on TV. He does. I did have a couple more postscripts. That was his daughter, Lily, right at the very end. And she would have been about to turn nine years old right there. That was 1995. So she's quite a bit older than that now. She's actually a singer-songwriter. 
And if you search for Lily Costner on YouTube, you will find quite a few performance videos. Oh, cool. Kevin Costner suggested that the Ron Shelton film Tin Cup might change titles, but of course it didn't. That's what the movie's called, and it came out the following year. Then Alan Silverman asked him about a film that his producing partner, Jim Wilson, was getting ready to make, and it was hard to hear that title, but that was Head Above Water which came out in 1996, starring Harvey Keitel and Cameron Diaz. I did want to say, you know, at the time of this interview, Costner was one of the biggest stars in the world. He was coming off of The Untouchables, Field of Dreams, Dances with Wolves, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, JFK, and The Bodyguard. So there was no one hotter right at that moment, but you just heard him at his pinnacle. A few weeks later, this movie bombed, and it was one of the most expensive bombs in history. Critics called it everything from Kevin's Gate to Fishtar. And then, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, two years later, he gave us The Postman, which was almost as big a box office disappointment. And that was kind of the end of him as a, as a leading man and as a force in Hollywood. He has worked steadily since then, as you've said, Greg, but not as an above-the-title superstar. He's still a good actor, though, and he's still a good director. So, you know, it would be nice to see him on top again yeah yeah it would be nice it would be nice but I mean the only above the title stuff is maybe he was in Criminal back in 2016 and he was in Draft Day both both those films were uh, were uh, not huge hits but at least like you were saying he's still working and well, but he was a superstar. Super, back then. superstar, yes. Yeah, and superstar back he then. is not now. He's still remembered from that. Yeah. When he appears in something, there's still that, hey, look, it's Kevin Costner. But nobody's going to rush to a movie because he's in it like right. they did back in those days. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a shame because he's a good actor and he's a good director. It would be interesting to see what would what we would think if we actually saw Waterworld after all these years. Maybe there'd be a little bit more of affection for the movie. I don't know if it's over the years. If it's unfortunately, it's, this is one of the movies that hasn't gained gained a claim or, or a, a second a secondary look over the years. Maybe it'd be cool. It'd be cool. There's you know going back to the Dennis Hopper interview, he was praising that action scene on the Atoll. And I was listening to the interview. I go, maybe I'll, I'll watch it again. See how ambitious it is. Maybe it's... Dennis uh, Hopper was a pretty big fan of his own performance in this. He was very proud of what he had done. Yeah, yeah. So if these interviews have inspired you to go back and watch the movie again, just a little heads up, be on the lookout for a then-unknown Jack Black playing an airplane pilot during the attack scene. Cool. Or if you truly hated this movie the first time around then make sure you get a hold of the home video extended cut, which adds 40 extra minutes, bringing the total running time to just under three hours. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Okay, amazing. And I understand that the longer version brings back a lot of the things that Kevin Costner took out that Kevin Reynolds originally wanted in. So it's, it actually hems closer to the original director's vision. Very cool. So I have not seen that. I think it might be interesting to watch. Cool. So that brings us to the end of Waterworld. Greg, you want to tell us what we're doing next time? I, I don't know. We, we might be going back in time, as we usually do with every episode. That's true. We do. But very specifically this time, we're going to do Back to the Future 2. But there's a second film. We're going to do two movies next time. And the other one is also from the same year of 1989. And that is Tim Burton's Batman. A lot of good stuff. A lot of good sci-fi stuff, sci-fi, fantasy, genre, superhero. If those are the kinds of movies that you like, this will be a really good episode for you. Okay, yeah. And, and before we go, we have to actually give a little bit of a social media plug because we, we're trying to build a community, folks. That's, yep. the, po- that's the point. Yeah. We are. Where is everybody? Uh, www.mattandgregpodcast.com. Is that where they are? I think so, or maybe okay. gregpodcast.com. And then maybe they're Facebook. all on Facebook. Where, maybe, where would that be? Maybe it'll be facebook.com, Matt and Greg Podcast. How about that? No, that's not Matt, actually not Matt, it at all. Matt and Please Greg Please don't podcast. go to that URL. Matt and Greg. How about Matt and Greg? How about Matt and Greg? How about facebook.com slash Matt and Greg? Yeah, Facebook. And we have, we're continuing to build our followers, our, our likers. We are. Yeah, a handful at a time. A handful at a time. You know, I, I do, I do like our, our, our mi- the microphone. I wish there was more of a more pictures of us, Matt, together in coots. I think 
we have just enough, just the perfect amount of picture of us. <laughs> perfect amount. Yeah, maybe, maybe Matt's right. But again, facebook.com forward slash Matt and Greg. Check, check us out on iTunes or whatever podcatcher is available. YouTube. YouTube our YouTube channel is, is also a great way to get our stuff. And uh, Matt does a great job with editing the, the clips as well there. Just the, the, the yeah, we put a little we put a little graphical element to it so that you're not looking at a blank screen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just hit us up with your comments. Uh, subscribe, support. I know, I know there's tons spread of... Spread the word. Spread the word. Tell yes. your friends. Yeah, tell your friends. And tell your friends how awesome uh, th- these Waterworld interviews are. And maybe they might... Yeah, like I, think, I think Waterworld's the one that's going to put us on the map, dude. <laughs> yes. Until then, we'll see you folks for Back to the Future 2 and Batman. Matt, you want to take us away? I do. Let's get out of here, folks. We're out. We now return you to your regularly scheduled lives. <laughs>